Hello and welcome to episode 32 of Gamers of Lost Spark Podcast. I'm your host, Anthony Chesson, and joining me this week, we have two fine chaps. First up, we've managed to pull him away from these Oculus pre-order page. It's the other spark on the pod. It's Mr. Darren Whitten. Hello, gentlemen. How are you doing? Not too bad, not too bad. And joining us this week, fresh from his sensual Santa duties, it's Mr. James Thomas. <laughs> Hello. Yes, the beard has been put back in storage for another year, or at least the white one anyway. And, uh... <laughs> I was going to say, do you have a beard? I, I have a variety of them, it seems, from half the f- shots that are appearing on Facebook of me at the moment, so yes. <laughs> Brilliant. But the white one's gone away. Yes, yes. Uh, retired the festive outfit, and uh, well, we'll see what Easter can bring. I'm not quite sure what beard the Easter bunny has, but we'll see what we can do. Maybe the uh, maybe the cover art for this week's podcast should be James by the fire as Central Santa, so people, <laughs> people can enjoy that moment too. <laughs> I've ruined enough Christmases with that image. <laughs> it's a cosy image. It's a cosy yeah, image. It does. It makes you feel all Christmassy and wintry, and you, you just want to. <laughs> I am talking about the right image, aren't well, I? I'm talking about the one where you're fully clothed. <laughs> yeah, the other one was just for you. Yes. Uh, oh, I was thinking that I'd gone out on social network. <laughs> <laughs> so, how are we, gentlemen? How how are you both? Very good, thank you. Yeah, the new year is treating me well. Um, how, how did everyone spend New Year this time around? I was watching. We watched a movie. We watched a movie. We kind of spent the Nicola and I. We kind of watched a movie. We had some kind of party food. Kind of watched Jules Holland. It was a very kind of quiet affair. Um, went up into our kind of new loft room, which uh, kind of had a really good view of Tunbridge Wells. And Tunbridge Wells really goes crazy with fireworks uh, on New Year's Eve. And it was uh, so we got to, we got a really good firework display. Cool. That's pretty we, cool. We had a slightly more sedate one, and we spent it on the M5. Um, not not broken down or anything, it's not too bad, but I uh, popped down to see my brother to uh, uh, just on New Year's Eve, and uh, got to, uh, pulled along to a, a Thai meal with half of his girlfriend's family, which is really nice, but we completely lost track of time. <laughs> oh no. So I uh, set off about 11 o'clock, and equally, going down the motorway, there was a very fine selection of fireworks displays you can watch on either side around midnight on New Year's Eve. Also, no traffic, so we just buzzed right home. Wow, that's really cool. That's really cool. What about you, Des? Yeah, that's cool. I um, usually I'm sort of I don't subscribe to the New Year's Eve hullabaloo, so like for instance, I'll give you an example. One year, um, I was proud of myself by watching The Wicker Man that started at 11 o'clock and finished at 1.00. <laughs> didn't notice <laughs> and I was quite proud of that but this year um, I was uh, I was up and playing Rock Band 4 at half 12 and, and, and through indeed through the uh, turn of the year I uh, heard a few fireworks but we were too busy concentrating on trying to trying to play our tune to, to notice any of it me and Claire just went ah oh, wow well, midnight happy new year <laughs> sort of thing <laughs> um, so yeah that was good but it was a result for me because the last few years I've been in bed before before 12 <laughs> wow I just imagine you rocking out to Rock Band 4 like happy new year Blackpool and then just carry on going <laughs> oh wow yeah, old Lang Syne <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, I wonder if that's the one I wonder if you can get that oh, that'd be so cool <laughs> like a rock anthem version of it <laughs> yeah, so not much. And then the coolest thing for I went to I kind of have a New Year's Day tradition now, where I go and see like a new film, go and see go and see a movie, and it wasn't Star Wars. Uh, I did try, but Nicholas said no. But so so myself and kind of my nephews, we went to see the uh, went to see the Good Dinosaur, um, Pixar's latest um, latest epic. I went to see that, which was really cool. But the the best thing about it was there was the the, the Lego store um, was open in Blue Water, and they had their, a whole new batch of Lego. And I have never seen so many grown men clutching a large parcel of Lego with a big grin <laughs> on their face. In my life. It was just hilarious. I was like, because they had the new, there was new Batman versus Superman uh, Lego sets. Um, and also they had the amazing Ghostbusters um, Firehouse, yes. uh, which which went on sale that day. And, uh, and I, honestly, I met a guy, I met the guy outside the Lego store. He was the biggest Ghostbusters fan I'd ever met. And he had like a Ghostbusters jacket on. I was telling him about the Dark Bunny glow in the dark um, Ghostbusters t shirt that I've got, which I'm sure he probably went and ordered when he got home. Um, but this guy, I got chatting to him, and he has not one, but two real life replicas, like re- life size replicas of the proton packs. Wow. Wow. So I, Is that one for his wall one to play with? <laughs> well, I asked him if I could go round and play. <laughs> I was like, can I come round and play at your house? But, <laughs> and then he had he had the uh, firehouse. And he, he actually said that he bought one from eBay a couple of years ago where someone had made one. Um, and he said it cost a lot more than the one that he just bought. But I said, oh, are you going to go and build it now? And he's like, oh, no, no, I'm not going to build it yet. I'm going to look at it first. And he's just going to look at the box for a couple of days. Did you cave? 
No, I didn't. I haven't yet. I ha- the, the thing that I'm trying to figure out is where in my house I can put it. Because that's, that's not that you sure, surely that's the kind of thing you make room for. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> you have an extension built. You're getting some building work done. Just add this on. <laughs> you need a, a room wing. for the firehouse. Well, I was thinking because we because we haven't like the the um, loft the office is being um, like decorated this next week. So I was thinking like oh you know we could put it. I kept saying that to Nicola. We could put it there. We could put it there. I mean this thing's like four thousand six hundred pieces. I think. Um, is it the thing. biggest set ever made, that they've ever done? I don't think so. I think there's some, a lot of Technic sets that seem to have a lot more smaller, fiddlier parts and probably quantity as well. So oh, okay. uh, I, th- I think it's just one of the more higher profile ones that's released. Because uh, to be honest, I think half of it must go into the IP tax. Like They must be paying for the brand name for, for a lot of it, but it does look lush. It and is. Uh, my, mine is in transit from... No, no way. Yep. I, <laughs> wow. I, I, I try. I spent a long time because what well, they announced it sometime last October, didn't they? Yes. And I basically spent the entire time going back and forth, like should I, should I, should I? Basically, I don't think I actually bought, apart from minifigs, any Lego last year. So that this is this is me retroactively saving up for this set, right? And oh. I expect me not to buy any Lego for the rest of this year to justify it equally as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you've got to, you're going to get the Avengers sort of heli. What's it called? The heli, heli, heli carrier. Heli carrier. Yeah, you're going to get that to compliment it though first. <laughs> May as well. Re- reinforce the bookcase if I get that one as well. I'm sure you said on the last podcast you were with us, you were like, ah, I can't, I just can't do that. That's something yeah, I, that I'm I not going to do. I probably did, but my willpower is is next to non-existent. <laughs> I shall remember this as I get to know you, James. <laughs> <laughs> well, on the car, was when we were on the motorway, like it went past midnight and the fireworks were exploding. And I swear within five minutes I was going, I remember what 2016 is for. Five minutes I was on the Lego website checking how much it was and whether it was in stock. Oh, that's just so cool. That's how I I <laughs> I've, I've seen some friends who are like, they're, they're trying this thing, like we've, we're saving it for like weddings and holidays. We're not going to buy anything anything apart from food and essentials for the first three months and there's me just doing ridiculous lego things within 10 minutes of the new year it's like yes i have no willpower or control this is coming home to me oh that's just i mean it is it is just an absolute thing of of beauty especially when you open it up inside and it's kind of fully working um uh, I'll expect I'll expect your good lady wife to periscope it when you, <laughs> you start building. You just be, be sitting on the floor with length. a big grin on your face. <laughs> but I, I think that's that's why I can. The more I've seen of it, and I think the more that anyone who's looked at Lego sets of recent years, they put so many nice little intricate details in and around the build that not only make it fun to build, but just make it fascinating to poke around and have a look. Like the Ghostbusters, they've got like the dancing toaster and the slime coming out the toilet, and um, like the pool table with the balls and things. Everything has just got so much attention to detail. Uh, I'm I'm so looking forward to building it. Yeah, it's 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 a thing of beauty. It really is. It's quite funny. My brother, I think last year for his birthday, I bought him uh, he's a bit of a car enthusiast so i bought him the mini you know the mini cooper oh yes and and that just stirred some lego monster in him because he just suddenly he just suddenly started buying lego after lego and now that and this this christmas he's his girlfriend bought him the millennium falcon which was also kind of another thing that a lot of people were tweeting kind of over christmas that they got and he just he just sits there and he just absolutely loves it you know it i think for me you know and probably the same for you guys you know it is the joy of just building that thing you know the yeah. Hours of fun you get, and then just looking at it, you know, I love. I've got Ecto One, um, and I just I sat and watched Ghostbusters and built that, and that was just that was such a nice couple of hours, you know, just sitting there and enjoying it. It's just such great fun. Yeah, I've only just sort of rekindled my spark for it really because I haven't played with Lego for ages, and then with having Sam, he's slowly getting to the stage where he's, he's got some Lego now he's past Duplo and he's got some small kits Yeah, and um, so I've sat and built, he's like build this so I've built it for him and I loved Lego when I was younger I don't think I ever stopped loving Lego it's just that uh, you know I haven't had any Lego for so long um, and I didn't even know that they did all this stuff you know that that I'm hearing about, you know, this this fire. I heard off you guys about the Ghostbusters firehouse, and I looked it up, and I was like, wow. And then I went into this toy shop, and I saw that heli carrier, and I was like, and, and the Millennium Falcon as well. And I was like, oh, this is so cool. And so I was building stuff for Sam, and I was just like, yeah, this is cool. I'm enjoying this. I'm enjoying this. So I can totally understand, like, just going out and buying this. I, I was looking because it came up on a on a site or two that I look at uh, uh, that the uh, firehouse was. 
a good price. I don't mm. know if it was any ch- any cheaper than retail, but it said it was like two hundred and eighty quid, two seven nine ninety nine. And people were going, "Oh wow, that's a really good price. It's a really good price. We've got to get it and stuff." And I was like, "Oh, it does look good." And, yeah. uh, and I was like, yeah. "And I have built some stuff for Sam, so I know that I enjoy this, and it could kind of be for Sam." <laughs> <laughs> okay, you you're joining us. You can see the justif the self justification coming into that conversation there. <laughs> yeah, well, like always fun, isn't it? You know, like always fun. Yeah. Really I, I just find it really tranquil to build as well. Like Ali and I got a couple of sets for Christmas, and I think it was New Year's Day. We just sat there like for a good hour or two, just building, and it was just so peaceful. Like the time ticks by, and you're just getting a proper Zen mode for it. It's, it's yeah. delightful. Yeah, it's therapeutic, yeah. isn't it? I found yeah. this the other yeah. day, um, and I felt back when I really regressed. And then somebody on on Twitter as well. I think it was uh, Steve Carter, who uh, follows a few of our things, and he posted a. A picture. He said he was looking through the Lego Bible or something, and he posted a picture of this spaceship that I had when I was little, and it was like it must have been fate. And I was like, oh wow, that was the that was the first and only piece of space Lego that I got because my parents were skint, and um, I was like, oh, I had that. It was so good, and it took me back. And then uh, we'd built. I'd built some stuff for Sam, and he'd got a jumble of this other stuff. Not much because he hasn't had that many kits, but he had a jumble of stuff. And he said, Daddy, will you make me something? So I tipped it all out on the floor and I was trying to make him a little spaceship but I didn't have many pieces and it really took me back to trying to make something out of nothing really and my finger like sort of hovering over the pieces as I look for something and I remember it took me back to when I used to do that when I was little and I was like I just want one of these ones (laughs) and I was just like oh wow this is awesome But I remember, I mean, when I was younger, I mean, Lego kits weren't as formed as, as we have now. You know, yeah. where we have Star Wars and Ghostbusters and, and, you know, Marvel and DC. When I was a kid, it was just a big box of Lego. And you did just have to put all of this stuff together. You know, occasionally maybe you got a car. But I just remember just, like you say, Darren, you know, just kind of tipping out this huge box and just, just kind of making something and building something. But it's funny now, when you do kind of look on Twitter and Facebook, and it's all people our age that seem to be, like, deeply into Lego, whether they've got kids or not, you know, it's just all people our age that we we now have that income where we can buy these stupid kits and just really enjoy it you know i mean i mean i've got i've got an r2d2 that i need to build i haven't built it i haven't completed it yet and that r2d2 i can't wait to build that um and i've got a i've got the batman tumbler um from the from dark knight but unfortunately that was where i bought it um and it's just it's ginormous so it's still in its box at the moment um but it's just oh i just love it i absolutely That's like love it three days worth of building alone own those two surely I know. I oh, know. That's like kind of. I could watch all of the all of the Star Wars movies and just sit there and build R two D two, and that'd be just. Oh, there's a plan. Yeah, that's wow. like, that's my weekend sorted. <laughs> that's brilliant, and I believe that some of these like sets, like people were saying, um, where where this site, this forum, where they were saying it was a real bargain for the for the Ghostbusters Firehouse, they were saying that it would appreciate. They were saying if you buy this and don't open it, you know, well, what's the fun in that? But they were saying that these these Lego sets are hard to find. And oh, they yeah. sell out, yeah. and if you keep them, they're you know, or you should buy two, one to play with, and one to keep, you know, in that in that typical way. But I didn't realise that uh, Lego had that sort of that collectability about it, not with the modern with the modern kits. Oh yeah, like, I think it's because of the the slight variations. Because one of my friends at work is an exact, he's a Lego fiend, and um, but he's in that mindset. So when the first Millennium Falcon came out all those years ago, I think he basically like scrimp save, put some cash together. He bought five of them, I think it was. Wow, my goodness. So he he's built one which is natural and then shoved the others in the loft and i think if he's telling me like most of them are either 50 to 100 percent increase in value just because of the, the the collecting nature that is around uh, lego so he's basically just like collecting uh, brick versions of his pension in the in his attic at the moment yeah why not? Absolutely. There is a website. My brother-in-law is a bit like that as well, where he because it was quite funny when I said about the tumbler and I said I've got still got that tumbler, I haven't built it yet, and he was like, "Don't touch it. It's just got off the Lego site because they have a thing where they, like you say, there is a kind of limited edition run, isn't there, yeah. of each of these sets? Yeah. And they just when that one's got the Christian Bale Batman and the Heath Ledger Joker, and he's like, "Don't open it. You know, just put it away." And it was, I think, there was an an article on the FT. It was kind of a there's a website called Brick Finders or something like that and they were saying that Lego is is a better investment than gold at the moment <laughs> so it was like, I saw that yeah, yeah I saw that wow <laughs> so there you go so so yeah that is definitely it's definitely worthwhile buying two of everything um, so when does your when does your firehouse arrive James it is in transit so I'm hoping sometime this week 
so you're working from home now. So you <laughs> just camp- no, I, th- I, get, I get it delivered to work. Otherwise, crazy things like that. Yeah, I will just be camped by the letterbox the entire time. <laughs> <laughs> Is it there yet? Is it there yet? Is it there yet? <laughs> well, and, and on that kind of bricktastic note, what have you guys been playing this week, Darren? What have you been? Uh, what's uh, what have you been uh, rocking? Me, I've been playing Fallout Four. It's completed. Oh. <laughs> hey, congratulations! Thank How was nice. the um, the tie up of the story? It was all right. <laughs> It was all right, yeah. Um, well, the thing is for me... It, it was all right. How many hours have you put into this game, sir? Uh, it's about nine days. <laughs> what? Is, which is shocking. I think it's got it wrong, but I don't know whether it... I don't know <laughs> so whether you've it, been telling your wife? It is a little <laughs> bit. I mean, maybe it takes the like, suspend time into account. Then it would be like six months. So, exactly. yeah. That's your game time, sir. Just embrace it. Yeah. Enjoy it. Yeah, I'm just a bit shocked because I haven't done much about, except mooch about for most of it, which is really bad. But, um, yeah, it, with the with new games coming out and everything, getting games for Christmas, I hadn't completed Fallout and it started to get me down a bit, as I mentioned on the podcast. And uh, I think it was on, was it Saturday, Anthony? I told you I was on a mission to complete it. Yes. Something like that, anyway. And I was like, right, I've got to do it. And so I said to Claire, I said, right, Fallout's going on. And I'm not messing about. I'm just doing story missions until it's done. Damn it. I'm sick of it. I've got to get it completed. It's like an albatross around my neck. I can't move on. Um, so I did that. And the thing is, um, I sort of flip-flopped. But I wanted to sort of be friends with every faction. And there's a number of factions in there. You've got Brotherhood of Steel. You've got the Railroad. You've got the Minutemen. Um, and another one as well. Uh, and so I sort of always like the best ending i like everybody to be friends so i was playing all these different sort of storylines expecting them to all join and the one sort of faction that i didn't bother with i sort of made a conscious decision to abandon them i think that's the one that would have joined everybody up and i didn't realize that until like hours and hours and hours and hours have passed and their missions have stopped popping up and then i sort of got this sort of feeling and I, I said to Claire I said I'm not going to get the ending I want here this is really bad but I've got to complete it and I'm not going back because I can't do all this again and I was like right what am I going to do and I just so I just looked at my options and forged ahead with a decision that I'd made um that it turned out really committed me to a path that didn't give me the ending that I wanted but um so I did that and I thought I just can't go back I can't I can't do these like it must have been like 10 hours you know I just couldn't be doing with it because I need to move on I wanted to play on other games so i followed the path to the end got an, got an okay ending you know it was all right but i felt a bit bad as well it's not like me to get the, to not get the ending i want um but it was okay quite a small uh, cut scene really at the end maybe it's longer if you get a better ending you get quite a quite a small cut scene that shows uh sort of what's happened the things the things that you've done and how that's come to fruition and then i was at the top of one of the highest buildings in in the map um, with my faction and they were sort of saying well do you want to do some more missions and I had some choices and it was like yeah it was like sarcastic or whatever and one of them was like no more missions so I said no more missions and they went well that's fair enough we can understand that we'll be here if you want and you just carry on playing it you can just carry on in the map and I just thought that's it fallout I've had enough man I've completed it so I jumped off the building I just, I went. <laughs> no more missions. Ceremonial sacrifice. I did. No, I said no more missions. Stripped off my clothes and jumped and just hit the floor and then turned it off. <laughs> you ran <laughs> naked. You ran naked into the Commonwealth until the radiation got you. <laughs> I did. Well, fell naked like sixteen stories and splattered on the floor. Wow. Um, so, but yeah, all in all, it's a good game. It's a good game. But yeah, it was. It's because I played it. I played it too reverently at the beginning. I think. I spent too much time in reverence and just doing my own thing. And then all of a sudden, games got stacked in front of me. And I, I was like, I've got to do it. I've got to get rid of this. So I kind of rushed it in the end, which is weird because I could have completed it quite comfortably if I'd have just done more story missions. So Fallout 4 is done. I'm happy. Um, I'm also playing Rise of the Tomb Raider on Xbox One. The completion of Fallout 4 has opened... Has up freed these new you channels. to other experiences. It has. It's, 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 it has, and it's a good... It's like walking out. It's like getting out from the uh, from the vault again. I've exited vault one one one. Walked out of the Fallout vault, and I'm now breathing the fresh air, the snowy air of uh, Rise of the Tomb Raider on Xbox One. But do you I'm... know what made me laugh about that? Because because I, I equally have started playing Rise of the Tomb Raider, and I got through the first tutorial mission. Thought, okay, this is this looks quite good, and then as it opens up, I realise half the game is scavenging. 
And there's just like the Fallout 4 flashback hit me going, I've just gone from one big game where I have to look in every single corner of the environment to another one. I mean, admittedly, it's far more streamlined, and I'm enjoying it, don't get me wrong, but I just thought, oh my god. That's, I'm that's going to get so OCD funny. on this one as well now. Yeah, that's so funny <laughs> Here that you we go that again. <laughs> because I was started Fallout 4, I'm only a few campfires in, probably about three campfires in, so I'm, it's early days. Yep. And the first thing that hit me refreshingly was the lack of crap everywhere i was like oh <laughs> i was like oh look at this there's, there's, I was like, there's a twig on the ground i was like i can't pick this up look look i can't pick this up it's not allowing me to so i don't have to look, go to every single crate i was like oh that's such a relief and then I, there were some red mushrooms on the floor and i walked up to them and i, I went i was i said that this is so weird i've just walked past this red mushroom and it's not allowing me to harvest it that's really strange. I'm not used to that after Fallout 4. Little did I know, and I was relieved by that, and little did I know that in an hour later, <laughs> it was going to open up the fact that I would be harvesting those mushrooms. And I was like, I kind of like, no! I don't want interactive scenery anymore. I just want a linear on-rails game that I just walk through. <laughs> you, um, you'll be yeah. glad to know that very soon you unlock an ability that makes it glow if it's nearby, so it takes a lot of the pain out of it. Oh, that's good then. That's good. But I was just like, oh, I don't want this, because I was just so relieved that it wasn't littered with debris. <laughs> I was like, this is what this yeah. is more like it, and the fact that it's all covered in snow. You know, in Fallout Four, if it was covered in snow, you'd be digging around, thinking, oh man, there might be something I can find. There might be an aluminium can somewhere. Um, so yeah, and I'm, I'm I'm liking that. And the other game that I've been playing is a bit of Until Dawn, um, which I got f- uh, for Christmas as well. Which, man, the graphics on that are good. They are, yeah, they're very good. Absolutely, I was saying. I think I was saying last week that the kind of giant bomb cast they were saying about kind of a, how good the graphics were in Until Dawn, and they gave it quite a, a bit of a nod, um, saying it was amazing. But are they are they good? Are they? Do they? Does it look realistic? Because my my worry was that it w- would look a bit kind of uh, a little bit rubbery. But does it look good? Yeah, the the, the uncanny valley thing that it's it's pretty minimal on them. I mean, there's this bit you, you sort of you play the first bit. There's an intro that you play through. It's really cool, and. Um, once that finishes, it kind of sets the scene, and then it cuts out from sort of the, the game per se, and you are chatting to a psychiatrist in, in his office. And this psychiatrist is probably a famous guy, but I, I don't know who he is yet, and I haven't looked him up, and I'm no good at recognising people, because I just see people as who they are in the story. <laughs> hey, that's weird. But anyway, I was just like instantly blown away, you know, and you know what the games that we've seen, you know, in the past 12 months, we've seen some pretty amazing stuff. I was kind of... I, I'm, I think I'm having to say, you know, and I haven't got a PC, so there may be better on PC, but I've never seen more realistic graphics for a person and animations ever than this psychiatrist guy. The way that his mouth moved in his face and the way that the corner of his, corners of his mouth pushed his cheeks around and his jowl was so real, it was startling. His eyes, it, it the, just just the animation of his face, the skin within within his face... The animations that, that were in it were just... I, I, I've never seen anything like it. The, the threads on his cardigan. You know, we're talking it put the order to shame. It was. It's just really good. And um, I was sort of ready for a tense game anyway. And he starts asking you questions. And it's quite interesting. I'm, I haven't played it enough to know. But I think it's trying to sort of analyse you a bit to find out what scares you so that it can tailor the scares in the game to that. So he gives you a bit of a test and he's sort of like... He goes, look at these cards... And just tell me what you think. He said, is, does this scare you? And it's a picture of uh, a farmhouse uh, with a cornfield and a scarecrow. I think the scarecrow had like a hook for a, one of its hands. He said, does that make you uncomfortable? And so I said, yeah. And he said, what if uh, the scarecrow wasn't there? And I said, it'd be all right. And he said, so would you stay in the house? And I said, yeah, all right. And then he said, so if I said the house was haunted, would you stay in the house? And I thought, well, you know, ghosts aren't real. So I'll say, yeah. So I said, yeah, I'll stay in the house. And like all of a sudden, he's pounded on the desk. <laughs> and he made me jump out of my skin. He went to, and he went, I think you're messing with me. He goes, why? And he gave me a mass rollicking. He was like, you say the sca- he's sort of like, you say that scarecrow scares you, but you stay in the house if there was ghosts in. He's like, you're playing with me, sunshine. You know, that sort of thing. I felt dead taken aback. And because it was so wow. real, I was kind of like, this could be a good... Maybe not a game, but a good experience where some where an AI character that looks so real is giving you some kind of psychoanalysis, and you know if you if you start in in the programming, it can tell if you start messing around, and it sort of like you know berates you for it. I was like, whoa, that could be that could be rather startling, and then it made me think of VR, and I was thinking, flipping that, you know, you could have these guys that sort of can tell 
if you're messing about. And they say, stop messing about with them. You know, you, you sort it out. And I was like, it was that real. And I just thought, wow, that's really good. And he asks you some other stuff as well. He gives you like like a raw shark test sort of thing um, as well. And you, you sort of visit him throughout the chat, in between the chapters, I think, through, 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 though I've only played about three chapters. so. But yeah, right. it's, it's really good. And when you pause the game, you get a, the character you are being at the time. It, it fills the screen with their face. And it, when it loads, it fills the screen with one of the characters' faces. And as soon as it came on, man, I was just like, wow. You know, and it takes more to wow us these days, doesn't it? Yeah. You know, it was mm. like the, the glistening of the moisture on lips and the glistening of moisture on skin pores and things like that. It was, and, and the, the shininess of the eyes and the aliveness of the eyes. It was pretty good. You know, in game, it's not as good, but it's still, it's still good. It's still really good. But, um, so that, by in game, I mean when you're actually controlling a character, the psychiatrist guy. He's just animated in front of you, but yeah, it's 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 amazing. Have any of you two guys got this game ready to play or, or, or no? Not no, this this is one I've sort of been missing. It never really caught me to be honest, because although I liked the things like the Scream films back in the day, it's never really struck me as something I want to play like Heavy Rain or anything like that. So I think I've appreciated how it looks from afar, but yeah, it's it's definitely one that I will I'll let other people play and appreciate from afar. I mean, what is what is the actual story? Is it the cliched kids go off and have a party in a cabin and then something something bad happens? Yeah, it's a bit tongue in cheek to it actually the way it does it. So it, it is a bit like that, and they do some silly things. Like one of the guys, you you sort of break into the the cabin because it's it, the the locks are frozen or something. So you break in through a basement window with your mate, and once you're in, he gives you a lighter and it's like totally dark, and he goes, "I'm just going to go and do something else now." Is that okay? And your guy, you don't have a choice in this. He goes, yeah, sure. And I'm just like, there's no way that I'd be like, yeah, okay, to that. Because <laughs> it's well dodgy. And the thing is, the cabin that you go to is a place where there's been a death. Like It's the, it's the same day. It's like an anniversary of a death that happened either a year ago or like two years ago or something. And it's a friend of all the people that have gone there. So it's just like, you wouldn't even be going there. You know, It's in the middle of nowhere. It's hyper dodgy. <laughs> um, so yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's totally like that. I haven't played enough to know fully yet what what that is like, but it seems a little bit like that it plays to it and it sort of parodies that that horror film thing that you know they're gonna. That's that's cool that it's knowing at least. I mean, yeah, yeah. But, but how much do you actually play? And I, I mean, I don't mean that in a derogatory manner because I know Anthony and I have been playing something relatively similar in this in this genre. Um, but in Until Dawn, are you actually moving around? Do you feel like you have much agency on what plays out? How, how is it like granular the, are the decisions? Because you said like you would not go in there, yet the script told you to. Where, where can you draw the line? What are you affecting? Yeah, there's certain scripted bits like that. I mean, you do fully control the character at times. Most of the time, actually. Um, but really, there's only one path for as far as I've got so far. But the thing is, it sort of quotes the butterfly effect um, in the story. And whenever you make a decision that um, is going to affect the game, you get an icon of a butterfly flapping its wings. And that tells you that the decision that you've made has changed the story. It doesn't um, have something flashing at the top going, Jeff will remember that. I suppose it's pretty much the same. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty much the same <laughs> as that. Um, but they, yeah, but they call it the butterfly effect. That's pretty funny, that. I didn't think of that. Um, yeah, but you I mean you control the characters. You walk around, the control's pretty good. Um, you use the left stick to sort of move them around, so it's a uh, mm-hmm. third person. It's make them walk with the left stick. It's a bit weird with the right stick. You move the head to look around, and so you, you're moving it, and you're sort of floating their head around, looking up and looking down, looking left and right, um, and that's to see if there's any clues around. Um, and then you see clues, and that sort of apparently, as you get more clues, you sort of fill in a profile for the secret of what's going on at the cabin. But I'm nowhere near understanding what's going on with that. Um, from what I can see, it there's a certain branch paths that you can go. For instance, the bit I did, the, the bit at the start that I did, there was a choice of uh, either you've got a drunk mate who's lying with his head down in the kitchen, or you've got some double doors to go through to go and see a load of other, of your mates that were in another room. And he basically said, "What do you want to do? That or that?" So you had a choice there, and it had a timer you got to pick, and then you pick it, and then the story carried on from there. Um, so that when the choices come, it's it's sort of like that, really. So it it's kind of set piece choices rather than you deciding which path to walk down with the control, if you know what I mean. Yeah, 
Yeah. Yes. I mean, it's quite interesting because, as, as James was saying, you know, we've been playing a game that kind of sounds similar to that as well, doesn't it? It's very kind of it's that it's that kind of you know David Cage, it's that kind of Telltale kind of formula, um, but obviously just in a in a kind of more scary. Well, I don't know the one we were playing was quite scary as well, but that's just re- it sounds really interesting. I'm just I just had a quick peek on um, Amazon, and it's eighteen ninety nine at the moment on Amazon uh, for like a physical disc. Yeah, and uh, do you remember? Um, I'm what, what, very tempted. Yeah, when when it came out, when it was released. Because we were expecting it to be a cut price game, weren't we? We didn't think it would be a full yeah. price game. And I remember it coming out, and me and you, Anthony, were saying, "Well, it's forty nine ninety nine, so forget that." But yeah, now I think I got it. You know, I got it for a song, and I think that's a fair price to pay. I'll be able to report back on it more when I've played a bit more. But I've only played it for about two hours, and a lot of that was standing hesitant because it's quite scary. <laughs> but there's, afraid there's to a, walk around the corner. Yeah, yeah, I'm a bit like that. There's a lot of picking stuff up with the with X or whatever. And then using the left stick to sort of rotate your hand to see what's on the object, which I which right. I can do without. But it's things looking, look, you know, it's it. I don't really like that aspect of it. It's like oh, just just if you're going to have interactivity, just make it better than that. I'd rather you just did some things yourself. Um, but yeah, it's looking good. It made me jump a few times, which was cool. And the reason I wanted to play it, I wanted to get a group together and we'd all sort of make decisions together. Mm. So I thought that'd be quite fun, um, you know. Have but I guess I guess the problem with those kind of games, and I, and because I, I know you were playing it with Claire as well, and I guess the problem with those kind of games is that you've got to make quite a snap decision, haven't you, most of the time? Like with the with the Telltale games, you you, you know you only have a time, you have a short amount of time, so you've got to be kind of quick. You you haven't got time to, to kind of debate your next move, have you? So it, it must be quite hard playing those with two. Yeah, it's like yeah, yeah, no, no, oh god, we'd run out of time. <laughs> what do you think? What do you think? What do you think? Oh, it's too late. It's now. It's just said nothing, and now he thinks I'm a douche. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I think it's one of those kind of games that if you make the wrong decision, it's instant death. Right, so it's pretty bad, but yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna play through it and just see what happens with sort of Minor Claire's sort of <laughs> choices, and then mm. if see what if we're happy with the ending, and then I think the joy of this game is going to come into trying to after you know the story arc, going back to the beginning and thinking, right, I liked that person and I lost that person. What what can we do to save that person or that guy? I couldn't stand, and he got through it all. Let's get rid of him. Let's let's just be horrible right. to him and just sort of have that agency over these people. So. I'm looking forward to... It's a game for me that, contrary to most games, I'm actually setting out to play it more than once, which oh, which right, I don't okay. really do, yeah. because I'm, I'm quite interested and keen to see how the story pans out. I'm just hoping, for and, and for this reason, I'm hoping that it's not a very long game. I don't think it is. I want to sort of get it done and then start again and have this all these options open to me and just see how many paths and split paths and split paths what that offers because uh, from what I've read you know there's there's quite a wealth of choices and quite a wealth of uh, endings within it it sounds like a completely different take from how I usually approach those as well because with heavy rain and Fahrenheit I was very much of the opinion um, of that once I'd seen that story and most of the decisions are usually made on gut decisions or how you're feeling that you've either portrayed the character or how you are as a person I almost felt that if I'd have taken any other route, I wouldn't be, and this sounds really fluffy, true to myself at that point. I would be forcing (laughs) the story in a different direction. And so half the time with Heavy Rain, I've gone, right, that's it. I don't even want to watch anything else on YouTube because this is my reality. This is how it's played out, and this is my story. Anything else is almost a what if, but this this is how I've played it, and so this is sacrosanct. That's exactly how I am, James. That's so weird. I'm exactly the same, you know, with Mass Effect, with Heavy Rain as well, with with uh, Deus Ex, with every game that I've played of that ilk. I play it once, and I play it true, and then that's my ending, and I'm happy with that, and I've got no desire to play it again because it's as if it would be fake. But like, I've got some mates uh, that say, like, I have this mate, and he used to say, yeah, what I do is, like, um, I'm just... He just says I'm hurried all the way through any game. Like it was Mass Effects we were talking about at the time. He just says, "Yeah, I'm just I'm just a complete idiot all the way through it." I said, "Why?" He said, "Because it's funny." And I thought I was thinking like you know, but it's like thirty hours. Yeah, you know, I I, I don't want to just do that for 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 kicks for thirty hours. I want it to mean for me personally. I want it to mean something. And so I'm I'm completely with you there. But for, with Until Dawn, I don't feel that it matters because it's sort of tongue in cheek horror. And you know, sort of, it's, it's a bit of a slasher thing. I don't really feel that it might change because, as I say, I haven't played that much of it. 
but I'm playing it as if I'm a bit disinterested, a bit distant from the story. As if I don't care about the characters, but I'm interested in watching the film. So unlike any game I've ever played, I'm playing it as if I'm playing the chess pieces from afar rather than actually what I usually do, which is feeling that I'm in the story. I'm feeling that I'm out of the cool. story watching. Which I, I've I ne- guess which... it almost helps, like, if if it is this genre horror piece as well, it almost plays into that. So where if it's, if it's not taking itself super seriously that can almost be part of the appeal too. Yeah, and it's as if almost, that if it was really clever, it could break the fourth wall, and at the end, and this isn't a spoiler because I don't know what the end is, it zooms out and it could show the player as being the ultimate ruthless villain or the ultimate saviour at the end, you know, sort of like a James <laughs> Bond villain. And as it spins around and with the aid of Connect or the PlayStation camera, it shows you the player and says, yes, and you were the cause of this. da na na Oh, wow. <laughs> dum 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 <laughs> It is. It, I mean, it sounds it sounds fascinating. It's definitely something I think I might play because it, it, it feels like something that I kind of want to play after playing. You know, as James and I were kind of alluding to, we you know we kind of had a mini zeitgeist around life is strange over kind of the New Year's and um and so so it does sound like something that I would like to maybe try after that because I've got that pang to to kind of play another game of that ilk. But it's really interesting because. The, the difference with, with kind of that and Life is Strange, once I finished it, I wasn't even compelled to go back in and mop up achievements that are quite easy to get because I didn't want to mess with any of my decisions. You know, I kind of played this five-part epic game and I really just didn't want to just kind of mess with any of those. I kind of liked how I everything that was done. I was kind of happy with what I did. I was happy with my consequences. And unlike a Telltale game, I mean, when you get to the end of a Telltale game, you've got all of the achievements. You know, you've got a thousand achievements. It's done. But this one kind of let a lot, left a lot kind of just there. And you can just jump back in. But I just didn't want to mess with it. I just kind of liked it. And it's really interesting. So I'm, I'm, I might get this. It sounds really interesting. Well, I will pull back um, next week, and hopefully, I should have played more of it, and I'll be armed with a little bit more information. But that's my that's my gut feeling from my first two to three hours playing it. I like it. I really love the graphics. But yeah, I'm playing it sort of as an outsider looking in rather than feeling that I'm in it. But yeah, you guys, you played Life is Strange. I've been hearing so much about this for the last few months, um, mainly good, uh, I, but I don't have a clue really what it what it is. So I'm. Um, imagining that it's it's getting your seal of approval yeah i i, I think if um well if i was on last week and if we'd have been doing our game of the year type things again i would be inserting this firmly into my top three uh, of last year um, wow. it yeah, me really too. grabbed me it really did um because i haven't actually played that many of the i guess the telltale style of games even though this is from uh, don't nod um this I guess builds on that formula. It's that um, it's a story-driven adventure game where you're walking around, talking to people, influencing the decisions on the world, influencing what they think of you. But also the occasional sort of like point-and-click bit where you're you're picking up um, items and maybe moving them around to solve a puzzle. So that bit I was a bit so-so on, but I was not prepared for what is effectively um, a high an American high school story to grab me so utterly because I think that writing in it is is fantastic um you star as a student called Max and she's uh, gone to this um really elite college to study photography back in her hometown and it sort of builds on how she's gone away from home and now come back and meeting up with friends that she's lost in previous years but the twist is that she suddenly found the power to rewind time um so it's that like slight little curveball but <laughs> what it does is make for a really interesting story but for me it makes for a really interesting mechanic because you talk about having to make these snap decisions in um in sort of things like the telltale games and and the the sony game but this one allows you to almost see what would happen what would play out you could try option a Okay, that didn't work too well. How about option B? Okay, that went badly in different reasons. And so it allows you just to try a few more things. And I think because of that, it's allowed the um, the writers and the designers to approach the game in a completely different manner. Um, so a lot of the decisions aren't necessarily immediately, this is good, this is bad. They're almost shades of grey, but have nice knock-on effects that go down the line. Wow, almost like you're a time voyeur. Yes, yeah, and, and it really plays on that as it goes goes down down the line because it adds in puzzles that allow that 
require you to manipulate time to move objects in the world or or save people. I mean, unfortunately, it's one of these games as well that the more you want to tell people about it, the more you risk spoiling it. So I yes. feel I have to dance around some vagaries and just shake people by the collar and go and say, play it, you will not regret it. <laughs> just play play yeah. episode one and you'll be hooked by the end of that, will yeah. you? It's just like, it's what, three ninety nine, isn't it? It's not much to kind of, uh, you know, kind of just uh, take a hike on it and just try it because after that I mean I did I, I just thought I'd try episode one and then I got to the end of episode one I was like buy the season pass you know? yeah. I was like two to five I want that now and I think I said to you James over Twitter though I'm so glad I didn't have to wait months in between episodes because I just instantly wanted to play this and 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 it, and you're right. The the writing of this game is is just fantastic. Because I, when I started playing it, I thought that was it. You know, I thought that's what the mechanics going to be. It's just going to be you're playing as this girl. You can you can do the time travel. So there, a lot of the puzzles at the start was you know you kind of put something in place and then rock a cabinet so a bottle falls down and doesn't smash. And and I thought that was it. You know, that was what the mechanic was going to be. And it was all going to be kind of you know teen angst. But it it changes yeah. and and it's oh it's just amazing. I think that's the nice thing the story actually evolves beyond what you think of it because i know a couple of people have played it going this is just a high school drama with a bit of time travel but it really really builds every single episode ramps up the tension ramps up what's going on around you and each one seems to be left on these really big cliffhangers because i can remember a few times over the weekend anthony and i were just literally just like tweeting each other going have you finished it yet have you got to the end of episode three i need to talk to someone about this and in the end, like even Ali took it as um, as a bit more of a, a televisual experience, and asked me to wait for her to be around to play episodes four and five, so she could see how it was played out. Because I just came away from episodes one, two, and three just gushing about it, and I was like, okay, mm. if it's this good, let's sit down and watch it. Yes, and 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 the you know, and there are decisions in the game that actually just they just hang there on your TV yep. and you do just just stare into space going what do I do you know you get so invested in the characters and in the story and you get so kind of swept up by it that there are two decisions and you cannot make you do you just you find it hard yeah. to make that choice and I found that a good kind of maybe three three times during the, throughout the game that there were things that I just did not know what to do. You know, you were you were torn. It was like, should I do this? Shall I do that? It was moral compass and moral dilemmas yeah. throughout the entire game, and it was just absolutely fantastic. Wow. I used on the the phrase on the more than one occasion. I won't judge you, whichever one you choose. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> and did you have regret after making some of these decisions? Did, a, it, did a it work them, out? But- I, I I did have regret, but equally, I think I was, as we mentioned earlier, it's, I felt like I was playing a character. So by the end of it, I I felt this was how my character would go. So there were still some ones where I just stared at it for two or three minutes and just tried to figure out what to do. But then equally, I think like the, the crescendo one at the end that Anthony and I actually differed on, we won't say what it was, but we differed, I felt my character had approached the entire game in one mindset so went one way and I know you went the complete opposite yes yes I mean, it's really interesting because the great thing about this game and is that you can look at the choices that you've made. You can then see it against the rest of the world, which is similar to Telltale Games. But then you can also cut it down to just your friends. And I think it was only James and I that have been playing this on my yes, friends list here. anyway. So I was getting a real kind of either 100% or 50% on all of the decisions. <laughs> and there was one decision that where I was, I was, you know, I was, I was a bit of a cow in one of my decisions. <laughs> and, and I showed Nicola and she was like, see, James is a better person than me. <laughs> <laughs> and I felt really bad. But when I was playing the game, I was, you know, similar to what you guys are saying. I was really caught up in the character. And I was like, that person's being horrible to me. So I don't care. You know, I was really kind of like that, you know. And uh, But when I kind of went back and looked at my decisions, I kind of felt a little bit bad. Yeah, I think the, bit, the difference might be with what I was saying with Until Dawn. is It sounds like in, in Life is Strange, are you, the, are you the same character pretty much all the time? Yes. Yeah, all right. the way through. Right, and then until dawn, it changes your character like every ten minutes. Oh, so you, you don't have the same investment, I guess. In that, no, sense. I think this. I, I just, it just dawned on me then when you were saying about the investment. It's usually because you're with a character for a long time, and this there's, a, there's like eight of them or six of them or whatever, and you're changing constantly. So you don't have time really to get that bothered, or at least not in the little few hours I play. So I think that's the difference. But this sounds intriguing. What are you guys playing it on? Xbox. Xbox yes. One. Right. Yeah. Xbox well, you one. sold it to me. I'll have a look. I may as well play it on Xbox it, One as well. 
Honestly, it's absolutely... Yeah, I mean, if you do, that'd be really good because then you'll get to see kind of both James and I's choices against yours yeah. as well. So you'll be yeah. able to... We'll be able to judge each other as people. Yeah, you can guess which one of us did what. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then it's just so good, you know, and it really is. I mean, the last time I got that caught up with a game... Um, over the Christmas period was Walking Dead and that was a good five, six years ago or five years ago when Walking Dead came out and it was a similar thing where I suddenly stumbled across this new experience that just had me kind of playing each episode and I was, but Life is Strange just just took it took it beyond the telltale they out telltale telltale yeah. you know, and, and I agree with James if, if we were doing our game of the year this week I would have probably replaced um, Tales of the Borderlands with Life is Strange wow, high praise brilliant it's it's just absolutely amazing it, it, and it is and the funniest thing i don't know about you james but whether you'll probably get this darren with until dawn but when i finished it i didn't know what to play after i it's it the was, first time in a long time as well that i just sat there and stared at the credits going i just have to take this all in i i yeah. generally haven't got as emotional i think over a game i can't i can't actually remember what the last one did because i think the story just got me that much Oh wow! I'm I'm a soft touch me, you know. I I often, I always pretty much stare at the credits when they when they roll and feel all emotional and reverent about whatever it is I've been playing. I was a bit disappointed that Fallout didn't roll the credits at the end. Um, but wow, it sounds so good, guys! You, like, I've got too much to play, and you slap me. You would me with need this. a hug. You would need a hug after Life is Strange. <laughs> you put it that way. <laughs> oh wow! I I love stuff like that. I love emotionally engaging stuff. So, yeah, it's another one to go on to my list. Is it long? How long are the episodes? Just so I can work out when to fax it. Five episodes, probably about 90 minutes each, James? Do you um, I, I think, I can, occasionally, I think a couple of mine were three hours because I was hunting around for... Because the extra achievements right. are, because you're a photography student, you have to go and find the shots. And you take pictures, yes. and that's where the extra achievements come. So I probably spent a fair amount of time wandering around the environment as well just trying to find those so that probably upped my playtime a little see i think i was scared to look at the achievements because i didn't want any spoilers so i um so i didn't look at them and i didn't realize that you had these extra achievements because i'm used to playing telltale games as i've said you know i just i didn't know there was extra and i think i picked it up on about did i i think i tweeted yeah, you pinged to you, me James, where are these just, things where are you getting these extra achievements from? And, and so that's a really good tip. If you're playing Life is Strange, look around, and then it comes up with like take X for photo, and every photo has a ten point achievement or a trophy. If you're playing it on PlayStation, wow, it reminds me of Beyond Good and Evil. Yes, yeah, it was. That's a really nice comparison as well. Equally loved game. Yeah, nice game. So, um, so apart from that awesome game, James, what else have you been playing? Well, at the other end of the spectrum of things, um, in terms of, I guess, a somber, enjoyment story and things, um, we played some more Keep Talking and Nobody Explodes, because my brother got the, um, the Samsung VR goggles for Christmas. Um, I forget the name of them. The exact one, um, but it's the one that you can put your phone in, and so is it. It's just called VR Gear. That's or it. Gear that's VR. the one. Yeah, Gear VR. Um, and so we were playing that with the family over Christmas, and I was intrigued to find out how this would work as a concept. Um, so my brother eased in my my sister and my mum through a little. Uh, it was quite nice. There was a there's a Van Gogh um, living painting that you could walk through. So he uh, uh, sort of eased them in, was letting them have a look through that, and then once they were accustomed to that, basically turned everyone into bomb disposal experts. So one person sat on the sofa with the goggles on and the bomb in front of them, and then the rest of the family were handed out bomb defusal manuals and flicking through it, and it went down a storm. And we pulled it out a couple of days later when we had a a, a pre New Year's Eve party as well pulled it out for what we thought would be about half an hour and we ended up three hours later being like this well-oiled, slick bomb-diffusing machine. It was fantastic. Wow. Is this the blind man's buff of our generation? I think so. I think so, yes. Or <laughs> well, the pin the tail on the donkey for the, for the techies <laughs> of 2016, 20, sorry, 2015 New Year. It sounds, it sounds well it's done. Re- um, it's really good. I think because it's it's got different levels of complexity as well, you can bring in, um, I, I guess you can ramp it up to your own liking, because from, um, depending who's at the helm, you can either just keep it to like the simple wires and buttons, but we were getting on, by the time we played three hours of it with some good friends, Like we were, there was Morse code, and there was passwords and anagrams, and it was the amount of variety they can throw at you at, with this thing just ticking down and the pressure increasing is, is impressive. 
Wow, sounds yeah, really cool. I tell you what, whichever headset you get for VR, do get this. Or even just get it on Steam. It's just on plain Steam. I was playing it on my Surface and it ran ran a treat. Yeah, yeah. So Gear VR, do you, I thought you could... Is that like Google Cardboard that you can just buy a housing and you slip your phone I in it? I think the Gear VR is a bit more fancy. Because um, I've got a friend who works at EE and he brought in one of the cardboards. And it works, but the Gear VR has basically got a D-pad and a couple of buttons on the side. So it looks like you're Cyclops from the X-Men when you're playing, because you've always got your hand up to your goggles. Um, it's pretty cool. But yeah, so it just adds that extra bit of interactive ability. But you still slot a phone in, do Oh, you? yes, yeah. Or, or does it come with a... So you put a phone, you, and it takes pretty much... Is it going to be a Samsung It's got to be a Samsung, or? and I think it's like a, a handful of models, but I can't be sure which. Okay, okay. I'm not that old fay with the mobile VR. I think it's like Galaxy 6, isn't it, or something yeah. like that. It's a Galaxy 6 and 7, yeah. I think, that it works with. Te- technically, I was really impressed with how it works. I thought, like, putting that close to my face, you get that screen door effect, and it would pull me out of it. Hmm. But as soon as you're in the middle of the game, or in the middle of, like, the walking around the Van Gogh, or going on the roller coaster, you just get absorbed. And it may look like it's a tiny bit fuzzy, but... As soon as you're engaged, I think that's that's it. It, it proves to me that tech isn't everything uh, in terms of resolution and stuff. It helps, but something even this, at the entry level of VR, I think works supremely well. Yeah, well, I mean, look at the old days when we didn't have the tech that we've got now. You know, I used to enjoy playing games like Jet Set Willy and where the exploding fist. And in them days, you know, my imagination did a lot yeah. of the work that the graphics yeah. couldn't. So I suppose when you've got, you know, you've got the limit there in front of your eyes and uh, you get immersed, that's the important thing, and then I suppose you just your head, your mind, your imagination takes over. Yeah, um, but apart from that, um, yeah, been playing Rise of the Tomb Raider. Ali and I have been um, tag-teaming that one, and I, I really like it. I enjoyed the, uh, the reboot Tomb Raider, and mm-hmm. I think they've really um, doubled down in the areas that I liked, like... The, they've definitely added more tombs. There is more tombs to raid, which is always a nice thing. But they've also expanded <laughs> the areas because I think it was, although it looked quite wide and quite explorable, I think it was still quite linear last time round. So you, there's a map that keeps on going and going and going. But every area is filled with little trinkets, little treasures, uh, things to scavenge, as we've mentioned before, to try and build upgrades and things. But then there's like sub quests in there, like. Um, what was it? We teamed up with the local indigenous tribe to try and take down the bad guys' um, communication beacons. So there's, it's op- it's not open world, but it's trying to be open world, and it it's really good. I'm really looking forward to spending some more time with it. Um, and then on top of that, I've been playing some Ark because I know you guys mentioned this last week as well. Yeah, how is it? Are you playing it on the uh, Xbox or on PC? I'm playing it on the Xbox. Um, it seems like a load of people have, have chosen the PC, so I might have gone to the wrong platform in terms of uh, joining in with the community. Um, I have mixed feelings about it, because I was drawn in by the fact it's like, guys, dinosaurs, you can ride <laughs> dinosaurs. <laughs> Which, ever since I was young... That seems like the perfect video game for me. Yeah, we've been waiting for years for games that. <laughs> yes, do this. yes. It's like I get to ride a Triceratops. What more can I want? Um, but, and this is part of the game. So I, re- it's this is more me than it. It's very grindy. This is like the Rust or the beginning of Minecraft, where you have nothing. So when you get spawned in the world, you are effectively naked and you have to punch trees and pull up grass to weave clothes or pick up stones and attach them to sticks that you've punched off trees to create an axe. Um, oh, I like that. It's it's good. <laughs> Sounds good. It's fun. Me. But when you have to do it for the 13th time in the space of like five hours because something killed you and then you can't do a corpse run because the thing that killed you is still standing over your corpse, it gets a bit tedious. So mm, there was an awful yeah. lot of times like where I died, spawned into an area, and I kid you not, I died within five seconds of respawning because I happened to be respawned next to a snake that took um, a shine to me and wanted to eat me. And so <laughs> it's not it's not very forgiving and it's not very friendly. That said, I've seen what can happen when my friends on the PC side of things have put together their little enclave. They almost banded together. They spawned in, came together created a defensive boundary i think around a little camp and managed to support each other so that there was a set of resources a sort of almost like a farm so that when you can get it going it goes but it's yeah it's it's really grating on me because i just haven't found that connection to it so far which is a shame because i want to ride a triceratops 
Yeah. Did you did you get involved with Daisy at all? No, no. I, I missed Daisy and Rust, and we did occasionally look at it okay. for something like, you know, can we use this as a land party? But because it is so. I guess you spawn in a random location. It's not predictable in that sense. So that that aspect's always scared me off of it. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Well, it sounds really good to me. Um, I like the fact that you're just sort of naked and vulnerable at the start. But yeah, that permadeath thing and then getting repeatedly killed, that, that's just no Yeah, fun. I mean, the nice thing is your skill tree carries over, so I'll give it that. Um, so every time you are eking it along, but... Yeah, it it just seems to be every time you die, there's about a twenty minute build up to you feel like you can then go off into the world again. Yeah, sort of trial by fire. Yes. Really. Yeah. So did you um did you just have you bought the did you buy the whole package? Is it the early early access? Isn't it on Xbox at the moment? Yeah, yeah. I think it was like twenty twenty four pounds or something on preview on Xbox One, and it's the first Xbox preview one I've bought. So I thought I'd give it a dabble. Um, mm-hmm. okay. Doesn't seem any different to any normal game. To be, honest. I don't think there's achievements. I think that's the only thing that it's missing. Or I could just not have got any achievements. I can't tell. <laughs> Most normal games they need loads of patches and. A broken at release anyway, so it's no difference, is it? I so say you're getting a bit of a discount. Yeah, yeah. Um, I hear. What's the menu system like? Is it? Is it? T- is it awful? It's awful. Is it? Okay? It's basically the is PC it? version pulled over to the console. So without any sort of. Like, it's 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 a good job that I went round to see what people on the in the office were playing like at lunch times with. Let's go. Okay, so that's how you do that. That's how you do. It. Okay. Had a quick guide and then went back to the console version. Went okay, I can get this now. But yeah, it's it's not friendly at all in that respect. That needs a bit of work, does it? It needs to sort of maybe be ported across to be a bit more user friendly. Do you think for the pad? Yeah, yeah, and it's. I think because I know I've bought it in early access, it's the kind of thing that I've dabbled with now. Um, I will probably leave for a break for a short while. I will then go back again in a couple of months and see how it's improved. Full, knowing full well that you they will tailor it. I think far more for the for the. Um, Xbox version, but you can tell it's, it's it's definitely come from the PC version. Obviously, the easiest way is to keep it as similar as possible for their dev end. So it'll it'll branch at some point, I'm sure. So your main game at the moment is Rise of the Tomb Raider, then I suppose. Yes, yes. Cool, cool. That, as, as it is mine, I'm just just starting out. It's nice. It's nice. It's, <sighs> after Fallout and everything else, it's nice to have something ahead of me that I can sort of plot through and looking forward to enjoying as well. Yeah, and for me, it's nice to know that it's only going to be like seven to ten hours or something. It's not like the rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> but it's fantastic. It looks amazing, doesn't it? Rise of the Two Raider. It's just yeah. The snow is beautiful. And mm. Anthony, you did say there'd be some crunch, and it does have that trudgy, crunchy snow sound. Yeah. It does, doesn't it? It's just yeah. glorious. It's just like it's such a it's such a great game. It's I, I mean, like I say, you know, I've kind of finished the story, but I do want to go back and do a lot more of those kind of you know, bonus tombs and things like that because I did get to a point where I was just kind of progressing down the story um, tree rather than kind of looking around some of the areas. So I do have a lot more to a lot more time to to go back to and kind of play some more of that game because it's just it's such a great game. Yeah, I, I think yeah. it's it, it, it's it, one of the best reboots like, in terms of where where Tomb Raider was, what could have happened to it. I mean, the anniversary in Legend did bring it back somewhat, but they've really taken what Uncharted did, I think, to the you know Explorer franchise, shall we say, and they've earned a lot of lessons from that. They've modernised it, but still, I think, especially with this one, kept the core of Tomb Raider. They've realised that the last one was far too shooty, so I think they're really doing Lara and her, her legacy justice with this one. Absolutely, you know, I, I was saying that there, there is that um, stage that I was playing that was on the E3 demo where, you know, I was just so stealthy and there a couple of times where I got found, you know, I could have shot my way out of it, I could have just gone gun blazing, but I, I didn't, I just restarted because I really wanted to just do that creeping, I really wanted to to go through it almost kind of in a non-lethal way, you know, there are some there are some points in it where you do have to get your guns out and you do have to go for it, but there a lot of the time you can just be stealthy throughout the game and it's just, it's such a great game and and you know and i agree you know it really feels that that lara is is vulnerable when you're playing it where you know with the other with the first one as much as i i really enjoyed it you did feel that she was just kind of a badass with guns you know she was almost like a, a female version of the uh, uncharted so but this one definitely goes back to the uh definitely goes back to the tomb reader heritage yeah, I thought there were a few nods to uncharted in the, in the small bit that i played so far like in the way she picked up a jerry can and I just thought, oh, that reminds me so much of Uncharted, and then we throw this. But then I realised that it actually distracted, because I thought it was just going to blow up. 
And I was like, oh, yeah, Uncharted. But then it actually distracted the guys. And I was like, oh, wow, Metal Gear Solid. <laughs> um, so I was like, I was like, oh, wow, a bit of stealth here. I didn't know you could do that. And then I, another nod to Uncharted that I thought, um, which is the first challenge that, and the only challenge I've come across yet, was where you see the boat that's sort of in the ice. Um, there's a big sort of like a ship. Yep. And you walk past that. And then there's a challenge in there as well. And I was just like instantly thought... That's so uncharted to me. It's like they just played Uncharted One because they stuck that submarine in the middle of the jungle, and I was just thinking, yeah, there's there, there's the inspiration there. What you need to do is just like get a space rocket and put it in the middle of Tunbridge Wells, for instance. <laughs> and you know that that's part of your game. You know, it's like take take some objects like like a ship or a train and stick it in a jungle. And jobs are good and really. I was like, oh wow, yeah, that's. And I thought I, I was sort of creating levels in my mind that you could do with that. I was thinking, oh yeah, yeah. So we'll we'll get this car, and we'll just we'll turn it upside down and we'll put it in the middle of the desert. You know that sort of thing. Even though that wouldn't be too unnatural. But <laughs> so you know, you, you know, what you I'm almost at. you almost need your Uncharted, like a kind of Mario Maker, but Uncharted, an Uncharted Maker. You could almost make a flow chart, couldn't you? You could say you could like pick pick objects. So you got a list. You could have like plane space rocket um ship cruise ship and then it's like pit locale um urban jungle <laughs> desert tunbridge wells <laughs> um orientation of objects so i'll have the ship sort of standing on its point to make, just to make it even even more of an anomaly and there it would be stood on its point um on its prow in the middle of tunbridge wells and then that's my level so you're walking along down the street just normally. Then all of a sudden it's like, what's that? And the camera pans around and there's a massive cruise ship standing upright on its prow. And you're like, whoa, that's weird. <laughs> and there, there you go. And there's a, there's a puzzle to solve there. If that was in Tunbridge Wells, an artisan coffee shop would open up instantly. <laughs> <laughs> um, Cruising um, for coffee, it'd be called. Oh, <laughs> awesome. There you go. There you go. Um, so, so is that it? Is that your, is that your list, James? Your yeah. Kind of, like you say, your, your, your current game is, your current kind of go-to game is Rise of the Team Raider. Yes, yeah, that, that's that's my uh, current jam. Um, but I, I hear you've been going back and knocking off a few things with three at the end of their title. I have indeed, yes. If it's got three, I'm playing it. It's, uh, so I've been playing, like, like I said, after I got to the end of um, Life is Strange, um, I didn't know what to play. So I just decided to go complete the other end of the spectrum. <laughs> and I and I just played, started playing the, the rest of Call of Duty. So I started playing Call of Duty Black Ops 3. Um, do you know what? I'm, I'm, it's got such a great mechanic, um, Call of Duty. I do love their shooting mechanic. But I have... Absolutely no idea what's going on in the story. It's completely bonkers, um, and I was only really kind of playing it because of the the extra mode that um, Darren was talking about last week, and because I I just want to kind of complete it and take it back to game. But you know, it's it's an interesting one. It's an interesting. I like I say, I have no idea what's happening in the story. Um, that new game that you were talking about, which is Nightmare Mode, that's unlocked, um, Darren, which is quite an interesting interesting take on the um, already bonkers Black Ops Three storyline um so which it basically kind of nightmare mode kind of does the same story but it does it from a it does it from a different aspect and also the zombies that are normally in the zombie mode uh, are kind of walking the earth so it's just absolutely bonkers and it was quite interesting whilst i'm playing the call of duty campaign that the zombies again from zombie mode actually make an appearance as well in the game so they have uh, they've kind of cottoned on at how good that mode is um and they've uh, they've they've put the zombies actually in the game as well yes wow. so does the night because did i hear last week saying that the the text or the speech is somehow altered or randomized is this the absolutely the text is is changed there, there's some of the same uh, it's almost from a different point of view so you have some of the text is there some of the the speech is there but it's also just kind of jumbled up a bit as well it is it's absolutely crazy it really is and it's it's quite funny because i was talking to my uh, my older nephew uh, on, on new year's day and i was just like i was like explain it to me you know <laughs> like what's happening because i just don't know i don't know if it's because i've just been playing it and haven't really haven't really kind of bothered about the game too much but i just kind of want to get to the end i don't want to leave the game halfway through um but it just keeps giving me another mission another mission but nightmare mode unlocked when you got to a certain point in that game so yeah you're right it does just kind of it randoms the the text it also kind of sees it from a different point of view and and you get zombies as well (laughs) and does it sort of explain that does it say does it say like at the start like 
we're going to show you how the game can feel different with a few sort of changes or, or anything like that. When it starts putting you into a story of of how those are the because like cause spoiler territory of this bonkers game, but it's just like it does tell you, it does explain what you're doing and why you're doing it. So so yes, okay, interesting. So, like I say, it looks it looks stunning. It's it. The, the, I really do enjoy the shooter mechanic of it, but I am just kind of I'm almost just playing this game to go. You're not life is strange, and I just want to get through it. Um, so that's kind of so. Hopefully, I've, I think I've got about one or two levels left to go in um, in kind of Black Ops Three. But it's it's you know, it, like I say, I don't want to just leave it. I want to just kind of finish this game and then, like I say, go go to my local game and uh, and trade it in. Cool. But um, so yeah, so I've been playing that, and also I am still playing. You'll be pleased to know, oh Darren, I've been still playing The Witcher Three. Well, no well. Batman DLC. No, no, <laughs> I checked. <but> <laughs> yeah, please, Batman. I don't want to play this <laughs> Witcher Three. Give me something. A new pair of trunks for Batman. Will do. <laughs> <laughs> Any distraction? Just anything. Do you know what? It was so funny today. I was kind of I was working away, working from home, and I have kind of Twitter kind of running on my Mac behind my work laptop, and and someone and uh, Arkham Knight who I follow on Twitter you know the Warner Brothers account they tweeted a screenshot and I instantly thought new DLC because they teased it a couple of weeks ago and I thought oh god there's new DLC but it wasn't it was just someone posted a really good uh, really good shot in photo mode goodbye Geralt <laughs> yeah. so long Geralt I tell you what um, Nicola's playing it because obviously where we are in the movie room I've got my big TV and then Nicola's got her TV to the side um, and she's been she's she's deep into in Witcher 3 absolutely loves it you know she kind of gets home from work now that she's back after Christmas after Christmas and she's just like you know can't talk and play Witcher you know it's just like what can we have for dinner you know don't watch any TV straight into Witcher after dinner and so I've been like kind of looking at the screen and there's some there's some real messed up stuff that happens in Witcher 3 a bit later on um, so it's just re- there's some really strange characters that I kind of I, I really want it's almost like seeing getting a bit of a spoiler alert from Nicola is actually kind of spoiler me on to play a bit more of this game because there's some really weird quests and there's like these three these three um, characters that just look really weird and very strange and um, so so uh, I mean oh yeah was, the three witches yeah. yes yes yeah. Yeah, they're, kind of, they're vile aren't they they really are they're really vile and then and then we kind of I stopped playing what I was playing because Nicola was struggling with Gwent um, so I almost I almost skyped you in there and I was like explain Gwent to Witcher uh, to, to Nicola because we were, she was having a bit of a struggle I think she got to a point in a story where I couldn't go any further without beating someone at Gwent um, so the card based game within the game so um, so that was quite fun just kind of working it out together and playing it together so that was quite cool uh, I must declare that um, I was never any good at Gwent I didn't do the quest that demanded Gwent skills. Mm. And I went through pretty much the whole game not playing it, but just occasionally. And I did like it, but there was just too much game for me to do, to do it. But I don't think I even came across that quest, which is odd, because I have heard people talk about this quest and they say, oh, I wish I collected all more Gwent cards because of this quest. But I don't even think I came across it. Or if I did, I just said, oh, it's cards. I, I don't want to play Gwent. I can't remember. No, absolutely. I mean, like Nicola got to a point where she was losing, so she went back to a previous save, uh, didn't kind of start that that um, that part of that quest, and then went off. And she's now just kind of scouring different. Uh, peddlers and, and different inns and taverns. She's now scouring the taverns of of, of Vel and, and just uh, just do playing Gwent and and kind of amassing a better deck. So which is which is really interesting. Yeah, I love the uh, music. You say say the witches, um, the three witches around the swamp or the marsh, um, and I love how the music changes when you're in that area. Sort of this eerie sort of uh, string, sort of violin, eerie Gallic music when you're in there it's oh uh, wow it really gets under your skin um yeah but yeah it's a fine game but it, i get the impression that you don't love the witcher 3 as much as nicola and that's fine but what i'm leading to with that is what you're going to play you know life is strange has left you both with a hole james has got tomb raider so have i and you've done that now but i bet you wish you could go back i bet you wish you could rewind time and go back and, and play tomb raider <sighs> Absolutely, you know. I wish I could join you guys and kind of because, like I say, like as you know, as James was saying earlier, it was quite nice having someone else kind of playing the same game, uh, especially something like Life is Strange, because it was like you know you did just want to talk about it when you got to the end. So it's you know I kind of envy you two kind of playing Tomb Raider at the moment, but uh, but you know I've got plenty to play. You know I've got uh, you know I've got Witcher Three, I've got Fallout, I've got Metal Gear, I've got oh, those yeah. games that are kind of <laughs> yeah. you know there's not long until Unravel. Um, so we haven't got long, we've got a month until Unravel, um, and then kind of. Banner Saga's coming as well, so there's quite a few games coming. Oh yeah, there's plenty of quality there. Plenty of quality just at home on the shelf, isn't there? 
Absolutely, absolutely, and also I've still got um, Disney Infinity uh, three point with the Star Wars, the Star Wars figures I'm playing with. <laughs> I will cease feeling sorry for you now. Yes, yes, I wouldn't feel sorry for. I've got more games than I can shake a sticker. And so with that, let's start our new section. Wow, we're like an hour in. Let's start our new section. And in this week's new section, Star Wars is potentially selling by the bucket loads. Sony had some network problems, and also the Assassin's Creed franchise has had a bit of a revelation as well. Um, the first piece of news is with me and now our good friend friend of the show Michael Pachter um, has been he's been on his soapbox again and he's been um, he's been estimating uh, games sold for Star Wars Battlefront um, so he his estimate I think um, he was at Fortune Magazine and his estimate was that Star Wars Battlefront has sold around 12 million copies um, since launch so he's estimating that we've got 6 million in November and 6 million in in December and if this is true this is netting EA a nice sum of 660 million dollars uh, for for the total game which which isn't bad going um, so I mean this is this is quite interesting I I, I would I can't wait to see the MPDs um, for December to actually see how high Star Wars Battle Frontiers but it looks like it's it's selling it's selling well uh, I was just going to say with the, with the film coming out on the 18th of December you know I'd, I'd expect the Januaries will be higher yes yeah you know, I yeah. imagine this was especially as you say like with the, the film coming out so close to Christmas that I'd love to see how many of this was downloaded on Christmas Day as well because a, a straw poll of everyone in the office like so many of their kids got lightsabers or little stormtrooper outfits or so you can imagine if there was a new console at some point and that popped up on the store that would be number one download as well yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I'm just hoping that if they have sold 12 million, I mean, that's that's a, that's a good amount. I'm just hoping that that really that pushes them to give more of that free content that they've done. I mean, they've did they've they've pushed out the Jakku map. Um, I'm hoping that it just and it gets them kind of really incentivized to to push out good content so we're not just kind of the fluffy content we actually get some some new modes like we did with the Battle of Jakku, um, some new modes and some really good maps. Yeah, if they expanded it more for free and fleshed it out a bit for free in a quality way, like you say, I would be a lot more inclined to um, dish out, shell out my money for for the next paid content because they would have brought me on side somewhat. So that would be good. I'd be really interested to know, and I don't think this has been made public, and you guys may have seen something that I haven't, but I'd really love how much EA had to pay for the Star Wars license. Ooh, I haven't, I haven't seen that. Versus, you know, versus pack to what Pat is estimating there of what they've made. Mm. I'd love to know if that covers the fee for the license, for instance. I mean, you'd think it would, but who knows? I, every time yes. I hear anything to do with Star Wars, there's usually a percentage share. That seems to be the way they do it as well. So I wouldn't be surprised if they keep getting some pennies from it every time as well. Why not? Absolutely. I mean, it's quite interesting, isn't it? I mean, the movie, the Force Awakens movie, has, has, it's broke $1.5 billion now, hasn't it? Um so, which is really interesting because you know everyone thought that Disney were crazy when they spent four billion or four point six billion on the Star Wars franchise, but they're kind of making all of that back just off of one movie. You know, it's they're they're kind of they're almost halfway there. So it, they they were saying that by the end of January it will it will break to the two billion mark. Um, so that's just it's nuts. It's, it's incredible. Nuts. It's absolutely nuts. It really is. Wow. But you can you see know. the ROI though, can't you? You know, you're seeing that return. Whereas I'm not seeing that return as much with Microsoft's investment. In in Minecraft and Mojang, you know, so uh, that's interesting. Mm. You, you know, you're seeing Star Wars; it's been bought for an insane amount of money, but you can see that they're getting that back. We're seeing it everywhere in the media. Um, I haven't really seen the Microsoft are getting back the uh, massive fee that they paid yet, but I'm sure they will. It's just that Minecraft has just sort of not evolved yet. Yeah, that, but maybe. I think it's, I've seen like Minecraft as well being used in some interesting ways. Because have you guys heard of the Hour of Code? No. Um, so this is uh, one of the... I, th- I can't remember where the incentive's from, whether it's just like a, an American thing that's come over here. But the Hour of Code is a way of trying to get youngsters into the concept of coding. Because, you know, you can... Maths, English, and like foreign languages, they're a, they're a concept that I think most little ones understand as they go into school. You have to learn how to do these things. Whereas learning how to code is is this weird... Like, computers, they just work. Um so this year, uh, Microsoft have been using uh, Minecraft as um, 
as the basis of the Hour of Code, which I think has been fantastic. So just before Christmas, we had a, a load of the, uh, the employees' kids in, and they were basically taken through some very simple coding exercises with Minecraft. So it was really cool, just like seeing them having to try and figure out how to effectively plot how to get Steve to a tree to chop something down to, to do something like that. So it's very abstracted away from what Minecraft is as a game to play, but they're using it in a very interesting educational way to get across this concept. Wow, that's really interesting because a few weeks ago um, at my son's school, he's in the, the very first year foundation, I think it's called now, was reception, so he's just turned five. Um, and they had a coding morning um, for kids his oh, age. Cool. And Yeah, and I went along to see to be with him uh, parents were invited as well because they appreciate that some parents you know probably the majority of parents wouldn't be familiar with with this this discipline um so i went along i was intrigued uh, I, there was only so many places i as soon as i saw the note i was like you're going on this <laughs> <laughs> definitely um and luckily i got a place so i went along and they used have you heard of scratch i've someone's mentioned this to me before i think that yeah vaguely it's almost like building blocks isn't it yeah, yeah. The guys at MIT created this program to sort of make coding easy, and it's called Scratch, and they released it free. And this is what I think most schools are using as a tool to teach coding to children. And so I went along, and the, t- the IT teacher there introduced us to uh, the software that was Scratch. Everybody had a laptop. And it was just going into the very basic steps of animation um, and or. Uh, you know, and and just ba- basic Boolean statements and things like that, yeah. but done done in a way that children would like it. I think the Minecraft idea might be better, incidentally, because this didn't really. It was very basic looking, um, but it was really great. You know, they said so. You get you, you go here and you get the picture, and you can see there's a, there's like several frames where you, didn't call, you just said several different pictures, and you put this one here, and then you make a command that makes that disappear and go to the next one. And the kids were great. You know, they're only little babies, really, at five and four. But, you know, they they were clicking the mouse around and um, they were they were absorbing the information and I thought it was great. And uh, the teacher was saying, this year group is the first year group that are going to be learning this kind of education, uh, coding education from the start. Yes. Other years are just getting it sort of now wherever they are. So this year, Sam, like Sam's year is fortunate because they're going to get it from the start and this is going to be built upon as they move up through school. And I was just like, this is fantastic. It's really good, really good to see. But I didn't know they were doing it with Minecraft yeah, do as well. Do you know what? It's That's click. Really they actually use Scratch with Minecraft as well. I've just quickly looked on the Mojang's website. Um, and yeah, it looks like it's the same interface as Scratch on the right-hand side. So, Oh, right. Okay, so they're... they're keeping it familiar yep. that's that's yeah. really good that's really good so yeah kids are getting taught coding at, f- at four and five years old now which is i think is amazing that's fantastic isn't it you know i'd love to have I'd love to have done that when i was a kid that, that would have been amazing yeah but then again I, you know i must say i used to just kind of code on my spectrum i used to write reams and reams and reams of code on my spectrum <laughs> oh did you well did you do it like sort of did it just come out of your your own head or did you copy it out of uh, the magazine a bit of both, a bit of both, where you would you would do something in a magazine and then you would maybe change it because a lot of the time it didn't work or maybe there was a syntax error or something like that. And then you would then just kind of make alterations and kind of make the game quote unquote better, you know. So it was just I always remember doing kind of like a uh, like an evil Knievel uh, kind of jumping. So you had to kind of hit it right on the ramp and then you kind of went over boxes and it was very basic, but it looked awesome. You know, I really enjoyed it. It was great fun. Oh wow, that's really cool. I remember my <laughs> computer studies class which uh, we only did computers in like sort of fourth and fifth year which was the last two years of school um all i did with my bbc micro was somebody smuggled in a copy of chucky egg and we ended up exploding <laughs> that and playing that on the sly all, all the way through the all the way through the lessons suffice to say i failed miserably at my computer studies exam oh man but that yeah that that's so that's so good i mean and that doesn't matter anyway because the, the languages are developed and things but they and also i think and you correct me if i'm <laughs> giving you a slight here james but i believe coding's getting simpler or it's getting <laughs> the front end to code is getting made simpler is that is that fair to say james <laughs> you're gonna kill me james is gonna james is gonna like, oh, I, james, ready I, to I, come I um i think i think access like ease into it is definitely getting um more easily accessible because this is why I like Unity. Like Unity. I was just going to say, like Unity and things, they seem very 
sort of accessible, more accessible than it it's, used it's to be. It's that weird thing that I, I think a few years ago there was the belief that just throwing something together in Unity would be full of coding. But actually, like the top layer of Unity is scripting. And that is the great thing, that it controls um, so many things just by refinement and like hiding it all away. That's great. And you can make so many more things. It's fantastic for prototyping and bits and pieces like that. The power comes when you then crack open those scripts and really start coding deep down. So I... I love things like Unity because it means it becomes more of a, a democracy at that point. Like people can find their way into creating games or coding. And then as they start to peer down and they find that they can do a bit more. And if they want to like maybe tweak this and the scripting doesn't work, they can write their own code for it. So it's that discoverability, I think, that the tools for programming nowadays, that that's where it's becoming easier, that's for sure. It's so uh, so. It's easy on the on the surface. You can sort of get to grips with understanding the surface easier than you could. But as you follow the rabbit hole down, that's where the complexity. Comes. Yes, yeah, and you can make it as complicated as you like because you know things like Scratch, things like I mean, they're both different ends of game making spectrum. Um, and even oh, I forget it, like the the storytelling. Um, programs that you can put it together they're wonderful because they give people a chance to express themselves and then as they find the limitations of those that tends to be where we find that people start getting very creative and learn more of the in-depth structure of a language yeah wow and it's great because they're getting the keys to the door now yes at four and five years old the funny thing with sam was like father like son <laughs> and we found where the games demos folder was within scratch <laughs> that was all he wanted to do that <laughs> He's like, let's play. F-. He goes, I like this. Let's play fish chomp, and that was it. Pretty that was much it. Lesson gone. Hour. We're at, we're just chomping. <laughs> yeah, we're just chomping. But I just saw that that link uh, for the uh, hour of hour of code. Is it yes. called? Yep. And it is the Minecraft. Yeah, it's totally the Scratch interface. So I'm gonna I've popped the link in our show notes um, for the links that we'll put after the show and the podcast because there might be a few, p- a few parents that listen to this, and that would be great. I'm certainly gonna have a look at this and see if I can download that. Um, because the familiarity of Minecraft will will get him even more interested. Absolutely, that sounds fantastic. Um, the next piece of news, Darren, is with you. Oh yeah, so this one is that there's rumours. I don't know if you guys have heard these rumours, but there's been rumours afoot that the NX might come out this year. Oh, I like these rumours. <laughs> yeah, I like them too. I, 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 wish, I wish I could believe them, but... Yeah, so there's a, a firm, an, an, investi- an investment banking group, called Namura Securities, um, and they, one of their analysts has made a prediction that the NX will be available by the year, the end of the year of 2016. Um, they base this... I don't really know what they base it on. I mean, you know, I could say this. I could say this. <laughs> but they're saying, they're saying that they accept Nintendo to announce the concept, and they, by concept they mean the NX. They're expecting them to announce it between March and May. And then launch it between October and November. And the quote that they uh, we've got here is that they they we think the NX will start to boost operating profits in 18th of March when it will have been on the market for a full year, and will have a lineup of software titles. So I presume that means I don't know I don't even know what that means. 18 stroke three because that isn't a year after this year. But they're basically saying that they they expect, because they've looked at Nintendo's figures, they've looked at uh, what the investments are talking about, and yeah, they predict that the NX will be announced very soon, March to May, for an announcement with the release of 2016. Oh. I mean, could that be possible, do you think? Do you think they could have... That's why it's been so quiet with the Wii U games and stuff, because th- they have been beavering away on that for the last I year. I don't know, because... Well, they shipped out some dev kits, didn't they, at the end of last year? N- yeah. don't, don't overestimate what those were, because... <laughs> I, I've, I've seen early dev kits for consoles and they are basically just can you please get this PC to pretend it's running this so it's the right. chance of it actually being hardware I my guess and again this probably guess is as good as this analyst firm to be honest it's a wing <laughs> and a prayer I, I'm I can I would really hope that it is the case because I love shiny new things but I can't see how this would be because if especially if they were pushing out things like Mario Tennis just before Christmas um they seem to have pushed a load of things out the door quickly they've got Star Fox coming up I just almost think they might have tried to help, hold back on some of these and that might be what they're going to do with Zelda but I just I just think it's too soon like they seem to have still been making big franchise games for this generation 
and have those teams got enough time to turn something around for the NX that is of quality, given that it's new hardware, given that it's this new system they're trying to develop. I, I just think it's too short a time frame. Yeah, how can mm. they do it? They're, they're saying it's going to be a new experience for players. So your, dev, your developers aren't going to just be able to snap their fingers and be a developer it straight away, are they? Unless they've got loads of first-party stuff to back yeah. it up. Um, I, I, I lean with you. The only reason I mentioned this, when I first saw this rumour, I discounted it straight away and rolled my eyes. But then a few more um, reputable sites picked it up. And I was like, oh, could there, be, could there be something in it? And then I thought, you know, it's worth floating it, isn't it? It'd be exciting. It'd make Christmas fun. Yeah. Yeah. But actually, Christmas might be fun anyway with VR, so maybe I need a break from that. I need NX to come out the next year or something. But I love a console Christmas. I've said it before, I'll say it again. Nothing better than a console Christmas. So, I, you know, another console would be great, especially if it lives up to the expectation that it could be more powerful than the existing generation. I mean, we're definitely going to find out this year because Nintendo did say, you know, their last direct that, that they're not talking about NX in 2015. They'll be talking about it in 2016. So they said that they're going to talk about it. Obviously, it doesn't mean it's going to be released in 2016, but they're definitely going to start giving us some more information. So it won't be this kind of big unknown. You know, maybe they'll go back to E3 this year and, you know, and maybe they'll they'll do another a press conference and rather than a direct and, and kind of go back and, and show this new technology and show the, the the first party games that they've got but i think for nintendo to succeed they do need to get those third parties involved which is why i thought you know maybe those dev kits were, were, were around to help for you know or, or like you say just those kind of pc builds were there just to help get those christmas titles for 2016 kind of ready for wii u as well yeah and it'd be really sort of weird if they're looking at they're saying they're going to give a a unique player experience that's not been done before or whatever it's just really strange to me if they're going to deliver something that isn't vr you know when really we're on the cusp of a a vr coming out in a a blaze of glory or i suppose it could it could fail i I don't i hope it won't and i don't think it will but um, there is that chance and it's like how could they not be hedging their bets with 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 v, with VR, you know, as, as that being there, well, it wouldn't be their USP, but that being the the kicker for their system, it's just what 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 else could they be working on that they feel could rival that? It's just uh, it makes me wonder. I can't come up with an answer. And really. I think that's the exciting that's and the, the scary thing, isn't it? Because we've seen what they've done before, yes. and and as much as we may poo poo it now, the the waggle sticks back in the day were were really good fun and blew us away because no one had thought of that. And then yeah. you almost thought they tried to see that touchscreen was going somewhere, but then didn't really invest in either the hardware to make it, uh, I think, overly viable because it was it, the, it it was relatively cheap, wasn't it, compared to most tablets you get nowadays? Um, and yeah. also, then yeah. they, they just missed out on multi-touch as yes. well, which was a shame. Um, but then they also didn't invest in their own game production, I think, to make full use of it. So I'm hoping they've actually thought about something that is exciting but more feasible that they can do on a game-to-game basis. Yeah, something as exciting as as the Wiimotes, but with more longevity. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that would be good. I mean, I can't think what it would be. I look forward to finding out, though. I mean, I'll I'll probably be getting one. Yeah. Unless it's really... (laughs) It can't be be so bad that you wouldn't get one. (laughs) Well, I said I I wouldn't get a Wii U. I I said I'd wait, I'd wait, and then I just watched people play at one lunchtime at work on launch day and was straight down game on my way home so oh wow i waited for a while it was until it was mario kart that got me it wow. was a good one to wait yeah. for i can't deny that yeah 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 i love that game i love that game and i've got bayonetta 2 now for christmas which I, I've, I've waited for ages so that, that's on my list to play as cool. well yeah, fantastic. It, that's uh, it, it's it, you know I was thinking I was looking the other day when I was kind of finished Life is Strange. I was looking at my my games collection of what I could play, and one of the ones was I had uh, Wind Waker, and I was very tempted, you know, just to kind of start playing to start playing Wind Waker because it's just that's such an awesome game, you know. And I was just I was very tempted to to kind of dip back in and and kind of just sit there and play. And it feels bad not playing Nintendo, you know. It, I, I don't know why I didn't, but I was just like, oh, I can't be bothered or something, you know. I had to charge up my pro controllers or you know and and i was just like oh what are, you know and it just feels bad that i'm not playing that there isn't a nintendo game in my game rotation well, I've, got, I've, got a confession. I've i've currently unplugged my wii u um that has been put to one side behind the telly i have put a nez in its place so there is a nintendo still under my telly but it's oh, just keep, keeping the good, big but, end but, but yeah it, it did feel like i looked at it going 
I can't think. Yeah, you know, I've enjoyed Mario Maker, but I, the zeitgeist for me and people around me have gone for that at the moment. So it's just mm-hmm. let's just save some power, let's unplug it, and hopefully save some of the battery on the uh, on the on the pad. Did part of you? In your conscience, in your in your conscience, say Nintendo, you have failed me as you unplugged it. <laughs> did part of your soul? Did part of your soul just sort of whisper that? No, I, Nintendo, I have long ago me. made peace with that. I am one of these people who only buy Nintendo products for Nintendo games. So, like three times yes. a year, I will plug that thing in and I will have a whale of a time. But otherwise, it just goes into this like cocoon slash hibernation state. Yeah. And then Nintendo get away with it, don't they? If another system did that, everybody would be up, up in arms. Like, yeah. Oh, it's not I mean, enough new IP, da 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 da, and all this. But Nintendo just keep regurgitating Mario Kart and um, Super Mario, and it's like that's all I right. Think, I think that they, I wouldn't say get a get away with it. Probably sounds quite harsh, but I know I know what you mean. But because they seem to regurgitate um, once a generation, I think that works. Like they don't. Because it's not a year on year. Yeah, spitting yeah. It I, out. I've got yeah, no problems with them bringing back Mario Kart because you know that it's going to come back once every five years and it's going to be damn good. And they don't need to produce a sequel next year because the other one is still good enough. And yeah, they almost yeah. th- and you're ready for the next one by the time there's a new console. Yeah, and they almost have a reverence for their own um, products in that respect that they don't feel they need to just get more and more out each year. Because as much as yeah, I like FIFA, I that's a good point. I really wish. I really wish that there you could always just like buy one pack, and each year you'd get the the update that would keep that as the same one. Whereas now I basically buy one every three years or so, and that keeps me tiding over. But then I miss the online play with my friends because I've slipped behind. But don't feel I can justify another forty quid. Whereas Mario Kart, you know that forty quid is going to last you until the end of the generation. Yeah, that's a fair point. Absolutely. And talking about franchises that uh, annualize yes, themselves, um, James. So- <laughs> Awesome segue. I thought you were just going to segue into the <laughs> I next completely news forgot what item. I was say. Um, yeah, so um, I've got a new story that says Assassin's Creed um, uh, news of the next game has leaked, and there's two revelations in this. Um, Assassin's Creed pun for everyone listening. Um, so the first one is that it looks like, um, from rumours still on 4chan and collected by NeoGAF, um, Assassin's Creed might actually be skipping a year. Um, there's reports that the next major entry in the series will be set in ancient Egypt and come out Christmas 2017. Um, this has been pulled together by a few folks um, on the forums who have, uh, um, I think, combined with their facts and they seem to be checking out from some uh, Kotaka, Kotaku scrounging. Um, but yeah, the original game supposedly was set in Greece, where you could travel to, um, but it was cut from the game due to time scales, And so they've now tweaked it out to next year there is possibly a naval side but it seems to be set in, in egypt um actual facts seem hard to be come by but the the one definite thing seems to be that it's made by the black flag team so hopefully there's more naval combat in that uh the real interesting thing for me though was that it's skipping a year like this this is almost unprecedented ever since assassin's creed came out um from two i think it was it was just year after year after year after year um for for yeah. good and for bad because i've really enjoyed some of those entries in the series but it sounds like they're going to take a step back try and polish it up and then come back bigger and badder for next year yeah. And I think, you know, I think a slow clap for uh, for Ubisoft is needed because that is just exactly what that franchise needs, isn't it? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Thanks, Darren. Um, you know, <laughs> I just think that's exactly what that's exactly what they need. You know, they are they are listening. They they've probably seen the decline in sales for for the latest Assassin's Creed. Um and you know, and they they're listening to to people and people just want to break, you know. It's probably, you know, if you look at their they have potentially got. There's been rumours that have been circulating that Watch Dogs Two, uh, Watch Dogs Two may be coming out. You know, so maybe they're getting out of the way of that. Um, but you know, I'm all for this. It's it's quite nice for them to just go back and and really just put some time and effort into into one of these games. And I think almost yeah. like the. I always looked at this like the the um, uh, how Activision operate with the Call of Duty franchise as well because although it's Call of Duty coming out every year different studios behind it give it a different feel so if you could get say Watch Dogs one year and Assassin's Creed the next you know Ubisoft still have their massive multi-million um, franchises that can roll and roll but you give people that mm. space that if they want both that's fantastic they can have both but say you've got that diehard Assassin's Creed fan you give him the 
the justice, I think, of two years of development and what it can do. Because I was really buoyed to see that this year they stripped out the the multiplayer from Assassin's Creed. So it almost said, right, we're doubling down on the single player. We're going to focus and try and make that the mm-hmm. best it can be. And because the, the multiplayer is never really featured at all for any Assassin's Creed for me. I know some people really enjoy it, but for me, it's always been about this is you assassinating in a city. And I don't want to go off and play tag or capture the flag or anything like that. Let's make this the best yeah. it can be. Yeah, I'm with you there. Absolutely, I, it's a single player adventure for me. Don't don't use resource on 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 other things. You know, keep it keep at its heart. Its heart. Hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. In some things, multiplayer works, but Assassin's Creed and and. Tomb Raider, you know things like that. They just do not need multiplayer. You know, Uncharted have got multiplayer again. You know, the latest Uncharted. And I, was just, I was quite surprised to see. I thought they would just double down and make this. You know, just that one, that one game, the ultimate, the ultimate game. But they, they seem to be putting multiplayer in that. But I. I, I am impressed that Ubisoft are doing this because it must be so easy for them just to continue making money from this. But if they're seeing their sales decline and people drop off, it, it must be a big red flag for them. So they've, uh, or a black flag. <laughs> um, <laughs> Boom! <laughs> and they have, uh, you know, they've just they've made the right decision. I yeah, think. it's interesting. You know, they, they're going to revamp it according to the rumors and. They've got like a thousand people that work on the on on the Creed titles. So you know, imagine them having this space to just take a step back, to have revamp on on their you know, on their lists as a, the number one priority is what they're doing. And it they must be a relief for them, I imagine. You know, I bet I bet they're sort of getting a bit sick of like they must feel like they're just pumping out the same old template each time. So it, that amount of resource with a decent amount of time. You know this uh, Assassin's Creed codename code name Empire. It could be, could be really good, couldn't it? It could be it could be really good. And I've had a rest from it. Um, I haven't played it since Black Flag, and Black Flag was the first one that I didn't complete, which is strange because I really enjoyed sailing on the seas and uh, I enjoyed singing along to the shanties, We Miss Susie and all that. Um, but yeah, so I didn't play Unity. I didn't play um, Syndicate. Though I kind of tempted to get that when it comes cheap, because I just want to, I just want to go around London, climb up on Big Ben and stuff. Um, but yeah, this might be the next one for me to jump on. A bit like I was talking to you, Anthony, about Batman. I've had my break. I didn't get involved in in Arkham Knight, but the next one for me, it, that might be because I'm not as much of a as a fan as you. That could, that, I, mm. I'll probably be ready then. Yes, yeah. I mean, the, the strange thing about this is that the you know Assassin's Creed missing this year is the year that the movie comes out. You know, we've got we've got that Fassbender movie, haven't we, coming out this year? Yeah, that, that's that's curious. They seem so, to be. I mean, a lot of the rumors say this is the next major game, so I don't know if there'll be some sort of um, filler rebranding um, sequel using the the um, uh, Syndicate game as a template for for this Christmas. Um, I don't know if there's a get out clause in that wording, but yeah, that that did strike me as odd. Mm. But equally, it's it's well, it's the setting. I really love the setting, Egypt. It seems like they're going to have a lot more to play with. I think as well in terms of maybe so the the tombs that you can explore. Maybe it's going to go a bit tomb raidery as well. You can go down the Valley of the Kings and what have you. But uh, again, yeah. that seems a world away from the the movie that's set in Spain. I think it is. Absolutely, no. It is. It is. It's really interesting that, you know, it's like you say, they may they may bring out a movie tie in, and that's the kind of uh, they can dance around that wording and kind of bring yeah. a movie tie in out. I think the film should stay as its as its own isolated story and step away from the games. I think the games have got too convoluted mm. unless they plan to fix that with the next iteration. But for me, I'd prefer it if they just had if it was just standalone with with nods to the games obviously um but i'd mm. really like it if they didn't sort of try and get their hooks into the templars and, and all that stuff have you ever heard the rumor that the watchdogs could be set in the same universe as assassin's creed people argue that uh, and it could be it could mm. because you've got the modern day and the regression yeah to be honest I, th- I think they could tie that in with the tom clancy universe as well and no one would blink it's oh wow yeah have the division in yeah. there as well yeah yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I mean, and so the next piece of news is with me. It's another. It's another game that's kind of moved into uh, into 2017. So another game that needs just a little bit more time. But again, kind of similar to Uncharted slipping last week. But we we heard about Uncharted slipping. This is another one where I am just 
just take as much time as you want you know and this is that we had an update from platinum so at the start of the year we had an update from platinum saying you know happy new year and they were like happy new year hope everyone's had a good time we've got some bad news <laughs> for you so they they kind of re- they released a, a press they released a, a press release and, and it basically said that in order to deliver their ambitious vision this is kind of part of the quote and to ensure that scale band lives up to expectations they're going to be launching the game in 2017 rather than than 2016 and they said that we just need more time to to bring this game to life and just kind of innovate those new features and the gameplay experience that they have planned for everyone so they are moving scale band into 2017 and you know i'm after seeing that demo at it was Gamescom that we saw the the last kind of playable demo, um, I I'm happy for this game to move into 2017 and just kind of take take all the time they need. Definitely, I, I think especially with what they've uh, as a studio got on their plate, um, I th- I think if they can dedicate more resources to that and that's the way, best way to do it, go for it. Um, I, I'm really liking Platinum's output at the moment, so I can't say I'm anything but excited. It's 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 on my list that's for sure yes no me too I mean they've got the Turtles game uh, they've got the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles game that they're going to be releasing this year so that'll kind of give you a platinum fix I've still oh, got Transformers to, to, to play as well <laughs> so well, maybe that's the game I'm going to play next so long Witcher I'm going to play Transformers um, but yeah so that you know, we, we have that and they are just kind of taking this and, and refining it and I oh, just I, I mean I can't wait for this game it looks fantastic but 2016 is was you know is looking is shaping Shaping up to be another bumper year, same as 2015. So something that really does deserve a bit of attention, slipping um, to next year is uh, I'm, I'm more than happy about that. Yeah, it's uh, I, it's what we say each time, isn't it? You know, um, I think it was Miyamoto that gave us the phrase. Really, it was a quote for, that can be attributed to him that basically he'd rather have a game that was good than a game that came out early and not as good. So late and nice and finished and polished rather than early and not so much. So, yeah, for me, take as long as you need. Is this sort of the biggest budget game that Platinum have worked on? Uh, I think it might be. Th- yeah, I'm trying to think mm. about it, because I guess Bayonetta's the, you know, the next Bayonetta's one. Bayonetta's the, the next one, yeah. but that's not... It still wasn't massive, you know. It's still kind of... Uh, I don't want to say... I don't want to say cheap or anything, but it wasn't at the scale... I don't think it was at the scale that the scale bound is, and it wasn't backed by like, sort of the power of Microsoft. So, you know, maybe they've just realize that they can do more with what they've got and they're gonna they're gonna give it their all and that that's that's great for us it's great news for us and for me yeah I, like you guys i think you're absolutely right it's something good's worth waiting for isn't it Absolutely. I mean, you know, 2016 is already, we know Sony have already given us quite a few games that are going to be coming out this year. Microsoft have already kind of tipped their hat at some some awesome games that are coming out this year. So for this to move, you know, it's not like we're fighting for games to play. You know, it's it's okay. So I'd rather this be good than, than waste this opportunity and this brand new yeah, franchise. we're fighting for time to play them rather than fighting for games to play, aren't we? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Well, exactly, exactly. So, so, so that's it. So, Scalebound is kind of moving to uh, to twenty seventeen. Cool. Well, you know, like I'm, I'm happy to wait for it. I'm happy to wait. So, the next uh, piece of news is with myself, and that is that I missed this, but PS Plus went down a couple of days ago for about twelve hours. Uh, you busy playing Tomb Raider? <laughs> like, that's why. Oh, put that on last night. <laughs> the night before. It might have been actually. It might have been. Um, so, it went down. For 12 hours, don't know why, don't know if it was a DDoS or whatever, you know, it's funny, I think maybe it was us that cursed it, Anthony, because we were congratulating them in the last podcast last week, that they hadn't gone down over Christmas. We were like, hooray, PlayStation, you know, you've protected yourselves, and they've protected the castle, but then it, <laughs> then it falls down a couple of days later. So it was down for 12 hours, I didn't notice anything wrong with my PlayStation, and I have, I have hopped on it quite a bit, I've been playing Fallout, you know, in a quite a determined fashion, Um but everything's everything's been okay for me. But they are looking at uh, giving some compensation out, um, so they're going to do some extensions. So we'll probably get an, a day's extra, you know, uh, PS Plus extension or PS Now extension if that's what you you know if that's what you were subscribing to. So I think anything that you were subscribing to that was affected by this outage, you can be looking forward to getting an email from Sony saying it's going to be extended by a little bit. Um, makes no odds really to me usually. You paid for a year, you get an extra day. <laughs> what difference does it make? Yeah, but I suppose it's a token gesture. Yeah, it's, it's, it's nice to see corporations this large reaching out and going, hey, 
we you know we've we've screwed up in some way we're going to make it up for you even if it's just a time in lieu sort of style so it's it's they could just in theory wash their hands but hey they're, they're doing something about it which is good yeah it's hands up we noticed yep we admit that you know it was a fault yeah here you go um for me I mean, I didn't notice it, so it's not it's not that bad. But when when it went down at Christmas, I didn't think like a like for like time in lieu was enough when it could have you know Im- impacted Christmas for kids and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Thought that something extra should have gone. But this this is fine. They've recognised it. Sounds like they fixed it pretty quickly. I haven't talked spoke to anybody or, or really seen much outcry on the internet about it. I didn't know until I read the news story. Um, so maybe it didn't affect absolutely everybody. But but there it is. It's been it's been claimed that it, that it that it went down globally for for that amount of time. And I'm glad it's up. And it, yeah, like you say, it's 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 good that they've taken notice. Indeed, I think. And you know, and yesterday, Sony announced that they sold 5.7 million units over the holiday season, uh, which has taken their total up to about 35, 36 million. So you know, they they have they've got, they've got a lot of customer base. So maybe that's why they're doing this. Because when I first read it, I just thought, do you really need to compensate for 12 hours? But I guess when you're running kind of 36 million users, maybe you know there was a lot of people kind of moaning at you for not being available for for half a day. Yeah, and people are paying for that. And if they're playing multiple player only games it becomes a problem or if they can't run a game because it needs to have a handshake with the network i'm not sure if the digital digital games can be played offline i'm not sure because i haven't got that many of them Um, but then it becomes more of a problem so it's sort of fair enough yeah if if it's your home console you should be fine with those ones but yeah so is that something that you need to do on the Xbox? Do you actually need to go to settings and say this is my home console or does it it i think it does it by default i think you actually have to if you have a second one then you have to say this is my. Then you have to swap it over, as far as I'm aware. Um, but yeah, right. by, by default, I think your right. first console on either system, you, if you sign it's in on, primary. that is where you can play digital games offline. Because I know I had that problem with Destiny when I was trying to go back and forth, and if there was a problem with the servers, well, it's like could I download the save and what have you. So yeah, it's, if it's on your home console, you should be able to do everything offline. Okay, and if you have any right, problems right. It's, you know, on either console, get into the settings and make sure it's, it might be called something different, but make, ensure it's labelled as yeah, your primary I, console. I, I think um, for Xbox it's home console, and for PlayStation it's primary console. But yeah, cool. Fantastic, thank you all. Uh, but yes, um, online, online, obviously very important for esports, and Activision are strengthening <laughs> their esports um, uh, hand by buying MLG as well. It seems this week, um, reports are that um, uh, Major Le- Major League Gaming, um, North America's largest esports organization, has sold the majority of its holdings to Activision for forty six million dollars. Um, wow. So it seems that like MLG have been on the slide for the last few years. Though I can remember a time when, especially Halo Three, Halo Three was where I seemed to see MLG everywhere, um, and it's, they've seemed to have yeah. taken a dip uh, in recent times. I think as rival organisations have come up, and especially with the likes of League of Legends and Dota just um, being their own force and not needing um, this like this higher organisation to tie it together. So they seem to be on the slide and actually been running into a bit of debt, if uh, rumours are to be believed. So it looks like Activision not only bailing them out, but um, following up from a story I think I had maybe last time or the time I had before on, they seem to be driving towards this esports presence, having hired like ESPN um, chairman and the former founder of MLG as well. So they're they're moving forwards, but I'm still not quite sure what their end game is with all of this. Because I'm not quite sure what Major League Gaming would be if it just featured um, Call of Duty, which I'm, you know, I'm sure that's got a strong presence. But I'm not quite sure what else Activision can bring to the table for MLG. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I guess they've they've got Destiny as well, haven't they? You know, they've got the online. You know, there is there is a huge online component for Destiny. Maybe there, maybe Destiny oh, the Two racing. is going to be. I haven't thought. Ah, there you go. Course, yeah. <laughs> Live on Diversify. MLG Sparrow yeah. Racing. <laughs> Yeah, and they bought King Digital, didn't they? If you, you know, a little while competitive ago, Candy Crush. Billion. Is this what you're saying? Yeah, this is what this is in the new. This is the new E Crush. Uh, yeah, the, honestly, this the only reason this story piqued my interest was because it just seems to be another another acquisition, another use of their funds, and uh, building them into even more of a gaming empire than, uh, than I think they were before. It just gets bigger and bigger. They must have so much cash. They just you know every few months that like Activision are buying something else, yeah. and they're just it's just like they're just. The cash rich behemoth, you know. I never realised the extent of how rich Activision was. 
I, I guess when you've you know, got things like World of Warcraft and Dota under your belt, they just bring in cash just, hand over just fist. Just money. Yeah, it's just pumping yeah. in. It's just coming into them all the time. Wow. It all started with Pitfall. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> so does MLG does it have its own does it have its own is it like a streaming service online does it have its own TV channel in the US or is I it just I don't think it has online? its own TV channel but I'm pretty sure it's got a, a presence where they put together all the events and all the tournament structure across um, multiple games um, to bring it together as a, I guess the tournaments as a, as a feature um, and, and streaming it online mm. um so you could almost look as this is a major sponsorship, I guess, for Major League Gaming to get Activision's branding out into the community a bit more. Yes, yes, absolutely. I mean, I've, I've seen online, and, and again, kind of my nephew who is... 16 you know he's very much kind of about kind of major league gaming he's you know he talks about gamers and streamers as if they're football players or if they're sports players you know that's kind of how he kind of sees them and you know he wants to go to these major league events you know where they have a a big stadium like the O2 in London just full of people watching competitive gaming you know this is it's just a ginormous you know it's amazing for like I say it's for those guys that is their that is their sports personalities and it's and it's really interesting to see this. I'm just gonna, like I say, I, I always remember the major league because they have that they have that logo which has like a PlayStation controller in the middle, don't they? So I I'm, I'm aware of their branding, but I've just never really kind of yeah. watched um, any of the. Stuff. I think it almost it's goes really back to what you were you guys were saying about the Radio One show as well last week, where a lot of gaming personalities now are not necessarily. Um, the people behind them, you know, like like, um, like John Carmack and people like we've had, um, it's more the people who stream it. I, I know people who've gone to Eurogame and were overjoyed to meet the Yogcast, and you know they do really good work. They were overjoyed to meet some of the streamers, and it's really nice to see that. And there's there's me so sort of like, oh my god, there's that programmer who did this, and people are just looking at me weird. <laughs> <It's> like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, super, but you're like you. You do know I did be the pinata. Don't you? <laughs> you're just That's how I get to the front of the sandwich queue. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Oh, superb. Um, and oh, look, the next news item is with me. And this was a really good, uh, again, a press release. Kind of a lot of my stuff kind of came from press, le- press releases this week where you know, a lot of people were kind of touting their wares for the new year. And this was uh, Xbox. They gave us some statistics about their kind of greatest games lineup in history. And, you know, it really was. I mean, I bought all of the titles that they, they said, the Halo 5, Rise of the Tomb Raider, Forza, and Gears of War Ultimate Edition. You know, all of those have, I've been playing those, those last year. Um, so they, just said before we kind of go into 2016 there's here's some stats here's some quick snapshots so it was always always quite interesting do like a nice stat um and i'll just i won't read all of them but i just kind of said they had um in 2015 they released over 200 new features uh, to gamers you know as part of the new xbox one experience and also backwards compatibility um there was over 4 billion achievements racked up uh in 2015 with a gamer score of 77 billion which is quite awesome there is in 2015 the xbox community cast over 6.5 million votes on the xbox feedback website that i always talk about great website if you want to see new features or if you want to put uh, suggest new features to to xbox um they also had that minecraft is the number one grossest paid uh, grossing paid game in windows 10 store um and it occupied that spot since july 2015 with nearly 1 million minecraft players have taken advantage of the offer to get the windows 10 version for free um that have already offered their uh, played their games which really interesting so I, i'll put a link to this news article on uh, on xbox.com um but one of the one of the great things about this was they also did a uh, you know what you can look forward to in 2016 and I'm just looking down looking down the titles there is just some fantastic titles coming uh, for on Xbox a lot of these are kind of console exclusive so we've got Gears of War 4 which is going we're going to have a beta for Gears of War 4 in spring 2016 and that's coming out uh, the fall Quantum Break comes out the 5th of April Halo Wars 2, again, is going to be that full um, title. And quite interestingly, Crackdown 3, uh, which I can't wait for. I don't know about you guys, but that's yes. kind of that's a big one for me the, uh, next year. Um, they're going to have a multiplayer in the summer. 
And that's all they're saying. And I also saw kind of AC Bongos was uh, tweeting out saying, you know, don't forget there's going to be a Crackdown 3 multiplayer in the summer. And, and he didn't kind of go any deeper into that. So people are uh, kind of asking, is this just the multiplayer side? Is it a beta? Um, but we're definitely going to get something for Crackdown 3 in the summer. Yeah. And I'm hoping, because I can remember playing Crackdown. Did Crackdown 1 have co op? I think it did. Yes. I can just remember yes. gallivanting over rooftops with my brother trying to track down orbs. So oh. if it's anything on a par with that, that should be fantastic. <laughs> I love that orb sound. There was on Crackdown Two. There were orbs that you got if you were playing on Xbox Live. Yes, there was like yes, yeah. that little kind of bing noise. Worse, just... there were orbs that ran away from you. I don't know if, if you remember those, but there were orbs that would literally, as soon as you got close, just cheese it down the runway and just like peg it down round corners, and you had to try and track them down. Yes. Yes, the greatest thing about Crackdown was when you were playing, when you were, I think it was Crackdown 2, but when you were playing multiplayer, you didn't need to stay near each other. It didn't kind of rubber band you. Um, you could just go off. Yeah. And I remember kind of like Nicola and I, we were just like different sides of the map because we were chasing orbs. And when you got one of these Xbox orbs, it kind of counted for both of you as getting one of those. And I just, I remember having so much fun with both of the, both of the Crackdown wow. games. I never played a Crackdown. But I'm really looking forward to Crackdown you, 3. Oh my god. It's the first one on Back Compat. I'm sure the first one's on Back Compat. I think it is. Yes. I think yeah, that's, that's worthwhile playing, Dad. So I'll tell you, that is just such I a am great game. I'm envious of you. <laughs> well, I, can't, I, I can't play the first one. I, I haven't got the time. Unless I, and I'm not going to see it. I'm not going to see it. But what I'm doing, I'm saving myself. Because it does look quite, you know, I can see the Crackdown 1 in Crackdown 3. I can see the spirit of it there. I had a little go with the demos because I, I used to get the demos all the time for everything. Um, yeah. But yeah, yeah, I'm, that's that, that's the one out of the list there that I'm looking forward to the most. I can't wait for it. But that's not till 2017, is that right? No, that's, um, well, multiplayer is summer 2016, and I believe it's 2016 as the full game, but at the moment all they're saying is summer 2016. Um, the list continues, we've got Fable Legends, open beta, is going to be in spring 2016. Uh, we've got Recall, oh, cool. uh, which is also this year. Uh, a small game called Sea of Thieves uh, by the, by Rare is coming uh, out in 2016. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, Pirates. Bleh, what? <laughs> uh, which looks fantastic. Uh, we've got Gigantic um, as well. And then we've got Killer Instinct Season 3. Um, they've got Gears of War Ultimate Edition for Spring 2016. Oh, that's for Windows 10. Uh, and also Definitive Edition of Ori and the Blind Forest. And then in February the 2nd, uh, Cobalt, uh, which is coming out, I believe. That is a Mojang game, isn't it? Cobalt, Cobalt. I'm having to. That's, I'm having to now quickly Google this one. I've forgotten which one this one is. I'm sure that's the one that Mojang came on stage and they were like, "We've been doing something," and everyone's like, well, "It's Minecraft too." It was, and it was, yeah, it yeah. was Cobalt. <laughs> Looks all right. Looks all right. Trouble is, they've got a hard act to follow, haven't they? They really do, they really do. So that is the list of Microsoft Studio titles. So, you know, it's been a great year for Microsoft. It, it was a really good year. And we've got, you know, some fantastic titles in 2016. And no doubt, knowing um, young Mr. Spencer, there's going to be some um, some surprises as well. I hope so, because that's not enough for me. You know, there's only Crackdown, there's only crackdown <laughs> 3 and Recore in that list. And uh, Sea of Thieves, Sea of what Thieves, obviously. Con- what about Quantum you, Break? You don't have to say that because I just thought I'd keep you happy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what about Quantum Break? It's not going to come out in Halo April. Wars? It's not going to be out this year, is it? It's nonsense. That's <laughs> why <laughs> it's nonsense. We're not talking Final Fantasy VII here. This is... I don't know. They've been going on about Quantum Break for ages. It's, it's not going to come out. Do, do you know, the, you... the one that I'm looking I'm looking forward to Recore because I just love the idea of that universe where the, the, this power source is shared between the robots and admittedly that, that trailer was quite short but I love the mm, style yeah that's my favourite that's my favourite thing so I want to see more of that when we get to E3 around that yeah period. can't wait yeah G- Gigantic was one of those ones the the uh, the art style on Gorgeous. Gigantic just look yeah. gorgeous. I, I remember seeing that, and I, I think I kind of tweeted out, I was like, "What's this? I want it!" You know, and then and, you know, and and you know, and the the style. And I'm not just saying it to butt you up, James, but the style of Sea of Thieves, the look of that, just looks fantastic. You know, that is another game that I, I can't wait to play. And we've also got, in similar kind of rare fashion, we've got Ukulele. Hopefully, 2016 Ukulele, um, and that I can't wait for as well. You know, there's, I mean, I think 2016 is just going to be such a great year for gaming. <laughs> Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, Joey's out for me. I, I don't know. I don't know. 
You're a hard, you're a hard man, aren't you? You just I'm gonna come I, to Blackpool right now. I wear my heart on my sleeve, you know. You know. <laughs> it's a, he's, he's still stung by the VR news from earlier. It's, I mean, we'll yes. get to we'll, listeners. We'll, you'll find out why he's quite grumpy very shortly. There's nothing indeed. to do with that. Yeah. It's just. It's just, it's just not up to scratch. That's all it is. That's all it is. It's not up to scratch. Uh, out of those games, you know, it's like, it's like oh, amazing year ahead, twenty sixteen. It's like, yeah, all right, that's three games. You know, I, well, I mean, I want to go. Ah, come on, you've got Gears of War four. Oh, I forgot. Out. Yeah, you're right. Four games. Yeah, One, I'm looking two, forward to that three, as well. Four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight. I'm counting eight awesome titles, and we don't. You know, there's in, there isn't a Forza there. You know, there is there's some surprises coming. Surprises. You know, we've, yeah. we've got Yanni. Yeah, yeah, that's good as well. Yeah, it's just Ooh. that. I don't, I don't know. We'll have to discuss it another time. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, 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 we'll talk about it in June and we'll see how right I was as Quantum Break gets delayed Crackdown 3 isn't until 2017 and we'll just talk about Recall because that's cool right I'm getting a pen I'm going to start jotting these down no! Darren's predictions <laughs> no don't do that <laughs> I'm going to listen to this podcast I'm going to start writing this down but, uh, new section no, Dazzy's arbitrary <laughs> comments <laughs> no no the games that you think won't make it and then you can say that you were right or wrong at the yeah. end of the year I'm happy to I, just have an apology yeah, section I, I'd like to be wrong I always like, I'd love to be proved wrong but you know and I think I'm, it's bad, you know. I'm right there. We, this podcast is about positivity. There's too much moaning in games, and I ended up be, I end up being the blooming one that's moaning all the time. <laughs> yeah, this, this weekend, this is just amazing, you know. And I'm just like, come on, Des. <laughs> it is amazing to a point. <laughs> <laughs> right, next news item is with you, sir. Oh, here we go. Yeah. Um, so there's, this is about a gamer. It took him five years to complete uh, Zelda: Ocarina of Time. He's just done it. You know, some people might sneer, but the thing is, with this guy, he completed the game, even though he's totally blind. So that's that's amazing. You, this is impressive. You know, that's just yeah. that's really impressive. How did he do it? What he did is well, his name's Terry Garrett, and uh, what he did, he sort of he he'd already proved himself because he loves games, and he'd been doing two D games like uh, the Abe games, Abe's Odyssey, and things like that, and he wanted to play games in the 3D space and sort of challenge himself that he could do that so what he did he set up some speakers um, to right in front of him left and right and he used the uh, sort of spatial sound from where they were coming where the sounds were coming out of the speakers to the left and right of him to, to pinpoint where the action is what to do where he was and sort of weave his way through the whole game using using I suppose you know just listening to that sort of spatial awareness Listening to the sounds from the speakers to his left and right, I think that's it's it's fantastic. It's it's almost like Daredevil levels. Yes. It is, yeah. The time where you're sensing the world around. Absolutely. You. So congratulations, Terry Garrett. It's a, an amazing feat. I can't imagine you know being blindfolded and completing it. You know, just I just can't yeah, imagine. It, it. it doesn't. It's I can't even comprehend how you how you go about it. So fair yeah, play. So yeah, he rigged the speakers and he used the sound from from the left and right speakers to just basically zone in to to whatever was needed. But there's puzzles in there that I don't understand. I can't fathom how sound would help. You know, he completed. He didn't skip the water temple, which is notoriously difficult. You know, I remember nearly giving up and getting in a right old stump with the water temple. I was just stuck. And this guy, you know, totally blind, and he's done it using just sound and just the awareness of sound coming from the left or right speaker, and he's used that to steer him through the entire game. It's quite amazing. That's very impressive indeed. Quite amazing. So um, there's there's some videos of him. Um, the new stories from Kotaku, uh, and I'll stick the link in the notes as well because uh, it's it, it's worth it's worth a look. And there's, there's, there's a video of him. He basically just says, "Yeah, I wanted the challenge," and, and all this. He explains what, what what he's doing and why he's doing it. And um, yeah, it's just uh, it's just staggering, you know. And he used an emulator with like a, so we could quick save it. And I think you know you can understand that's fair enough. But I just hope that I hope he enjoyed it. I hope it just wasn't one of those challenges. That it was just like I just want to do it, and it's an, it's really a nightmare, you know. I just hope he enjoyed doing it as well, you know. Enjoyed playing it. I mean, he must have done to spend all that time, you know. Yeah, to, to keep on going after five years, you think at some point early on it would be, am I enjoying this? Yeah, he surely must have. Yeah, I hope so. So well done, that man. Uh, and the the next news story is with me, and like Anthony, I am a big fan of stats, and so <laughs> this week um, there have been. 
uh, a series of stats scraped from Steam to show us uh, the top sellers of 2015. Now, these aren't official stats. These are all pulled from uh, an app called Steam Spy that tries to pull together various data that you can access through Steam and its websites and what have you. Um, so they've they've pulled together what they think is a very representative sample of, of how games have sold and how much revenue they've brought in. Um, now, I don't know if you two have looked at the, this, this list already. No. Um, but do you want to hazard a guess what the top three Undertale. were? Um, uh, no. Und- Undertale. No. Um, Undertale, I'm trying to Undertale was at number 12 oh, on the okay. list. Judging by the amount of screenshots, I would probably say, well, Call of Duty, that's got to kind of be high, surely. Call of Duty came in at number 14. Ooh, no. Um, um, what? One more guess before I put put you out of your misery. Fallout Four. Fallout Four came at number two. Yes. Oh wow! That, so if if this was Family Fortunes, you would now be getting at least some money to take. <laughs> yes, the, the chess and family. We now yeah. can now answer all the questions. Uh, so the top five were H one Z one was at number five. Rocket League was at number oh, wow. four. Ark came in at number three. Uh, Fallout 4 came in at number 2 and then Grand Theft Auto 5 uh, sat at the top of the pile Wow! Um, all of them sold over 2 million copies by these estimations with Grand Theft Auto uh, coming in at just around 3.8 million copies Wow! And it's in- so this is this is all again sort of estimated best guess work, but it's it's considered to be reasonably uh, spot on. But that supposedly netted Rockstar one hundred and sixty one million dollars. Wow, which is nuts. That's just nuts. That's just from Steam alone in that yep. year. Oh, yeah. Wow. The most disappointing thing I saw on this was so at number ten in games sold was Life is Strange, mm. um, selling about a million copies, uh, only netting the studio two point six million dollars though. So people have been going hard on the on, on the sale. I don't know if actually if that's the first episode. Thinking about, right. it. I guess that's the first episode. So that probably makes more sense. But yeah, I, guys, get yourself a bargain there because mm. that's good. That's good. Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. You know, I'd I'd love to that studio. I mean, I I haven't heard of that studio. Uh, do, is it Don't Nod? It is, isn't it? Yeah, I haven't yeah. heard of that studio before. Life is Strange. I don't know if that was their first title, but that's definitely. I've I've started following them on Twitter. You know, I think I did. I did tweet out something after I finished the game. You know, kind of congratulating them and just saying what a wonderful experience it was. And I, you know, they liked it. So I always quite like that. It's quite nice when they're actually kind of looking at uh, at their tweets and stuff. So I followed those guys because I'm going to watch. I want to see what they do next. Yeah. So um, but that's it's it's nice to see them riding high as it well because they effect um, from these estimations they sold more than Metal Gear Solid 5 on the PC wow well, that's. I mean, I love. I love the fact. I mean, Darren and I were talking. I think it was last week or the week before, where we were talking about that we wish we had some stats like this for the the digital downloads for consoles. You know, wish there was kind of like something a Steam Spy for for Xbox and PlayStation Network because it would be really interesting to see yeah. the, the the how the uptake of digital titles are. You know, and it's just you know it's really interesting. So we'll we'll stick a link to that. Is there? there we'll stick a link to that article as well um, in our show notes, James. So that's because that's quite an interesting one. I'm going to have a look. Yeah, what, what, whereabouts <laughs> was the show. whereabouts was Ark, James? Ark um, Ark was sales wise number three, uh, and then grossing. I don't think it made. Ark came in at number fourteen for grossing, and then number three for sales. Wow, it's really interesting because that's for say top seller of 2015 and we covered a story last week where Ark in, um, on the Xbox One the number of players so the take up has equaled the PC in, in like the couple of months that it's been out yeah I, I would be surprised if that wasn't something like current players or something like that because I would be very impressive if Ark sold 2.4 million in less than a month it just doesn't see especially if it's a preview program one as well yeah. But fair play, fair play. They seem to be moving the numbers. Yeah, yeah. Really interesting as well. This list that I've uh, just clicked on that link. This link is like there's over two and a quarter million downloads for Rocket League. Yes. For potentially what would have been maybe your game of the year, James. It might have been. <laughs> it might have. We have got the corrections section later, haven't we? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that's that's really interesting, isn't it? I mean, because obviously it had a big uptake on the PlayStation Network because it was free to play. Um, but that's that's two oh, two and a quarter million. That's that's yeah. Wow, wow. You, you must think that some of the goodwill and noise that was made on the PlayStation came over 
to Rocket League on the PC. So I, I would almost think some of those sales came over like after after the first month, and then it just went up as everyone was speaking highly of it. Yes. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah, what otherwise might have been a game that came out to little fanfare, maybe they didn't have the marketing budget to get you know get that awareness. The PlayStation just rocketed yep. it up there. Excuse the yeah. unintended pun. <laughs> 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 cool, cool. Well, from from the top sellers of 2015 to a couple of games to look forward to in 2016, um, we've got a couple of quick game announcements here, and that is Rise of the Tomb Raider, and the game that we all love. It's coming to the PC on the 28th of January. Got announced the other day. And that's going to be on Steam and Windows 10. So, yeah, that's something to look forward to if you haven't got a console or if you just wanted that sort of ultimate experience. Um, quite interesting is the spec. So we've got the minimum spec for Rise of the Tomb Raider on PC. You need a Windows 7 64-bit. You need a Intel i3 2100 or AMD equivalent. Graphics card wise, you want an NVIDIA GTX 650 with 2 gig of memory or an AMD HD 7770 with 2 gig. 6 gig of RAM, hard drive space doesn't really matter, 25 gig, uh, DirectX 11. So yeah, um, it's it's not too bad that, it's not, it's not too demanding is it? No. I can only imagine how pretty this looks as well. I mean if we're saying how nice the Xbox One version uh, goes, if you're going to throw this at max settings this is going to look... Absolutely yeah, and gorgeous. they've put 4K resolution support in for the PC as well. Oh, really? Oh, I'm looking forward to Digital Foundry getting a hold of this um, in a couple of weeks' time and then start putting the comparison videos because I bet 4K is just going to look gorgeous. Drop dead staggering, yeah. Oh. The, the worst thing about that is I don't have a monitor that can show me how good it looks. You'd need, <laughs> like, yeah, even you'd need quite a large even screen, if, wouldn't you, really, to really appreciate that? And see, I've got my TV down in the games room, so whenever kind of you get that kind of 4K... Um, showing or a 4k version of, of those i just go straight down there and fire up youtube <laughs> and like, i just sit there and think wow i saw grand theft auto in 4k just looked stunning looked almost real world and we spoke about star wars as well i mean star wars but uh, star wars battlefront in 4k was was stunning it was incredible you see they they make sense a good friend of mine has recently bought a 4k monitor for his pc and like I was asking, you know, is it any good? How's it going? Would you recommend it? And um, his girlfriend sent me a picture of this ridiculously large 4K monitor on the BBC website. And a normal website, it just basically, because it's Pixel 1, it's just this thin ribbon down the centre of the screen where all the data is. <laughs> and then it's just white space for feet upon feet either side of it. Wow. And she says, internet browsing is a bit ridiculous on it. So. <laughs> That's just so cool, but I guess you could have multiple windows. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You could have like about 20 full pages opened. <laughs> yeah. oh, I've still got room for more. So that's that's Tomb Raider coming out on PC. And also, I mean, this is just, uh, I thought I'd mention it because I love the cartoon of Rick and Morty. And uh, they're bringing out a game. It's going to come to iOS and Android platforms on the 14th of January. Um, a Rick and Morty game it looks like it's going to be a bit of a pokemon inspired game um it's going to be right. free um i don't know i think you've watched it haven't you anthony i don't know if you've if you've seen it james have you ever watched the cartoon rick and morty from adult swim i've seen bits and pieces all i know is there's a chap that looks like he's from back to the future and he burns yeah a lot. it's like um it's basically like like doc and marty <laughs> from back to the future getting into loads of scrapes and it's I think it's hilarious. It's really funny. Um, so you know, it might be funny, <laughs> it might be rubbish. But I just thought I'd, I just thought I'd add it in there because because I can and because I know it's oh wow, Rick and Morty game. I'm going to have a look at it. But I hope it's not too long. <laughs> It'll be a game that I play in transit. I think I'll, I'll have a look because I, I haven't got really, I haven't really got I haven't got a Vita um, anymore, and uh, my DS is in storage. So. This might be a game that's interesting that I'll be interested to have a look at when I've completed Monument, Monument Valley. That's cool. a cool game. It, it, actually, throwing in some uh, announcements, uh, I was really buoyed to say today that uh, Box Boy, the um, 3DS little puzzle platformer, uh, was announced to get a sequel today as well. It's coming out in Japan, and uh, I'm hoping hoping we get a release date over in the West sometime soon. Did you? Did either of you play Box Boy? No. 
No. No, I can, I can tell by the silence. There's <laughs> bewildered what, silence. What is this weird thing? You do this every time, James. Like, <laughs> <laughs> well, we're the sparks. We know the games. <laughs> <laughs> Just not along. <laughs> So it was it was this really nice little um, uh, downloadable game that came out for the 3DS. I think it might have been around Easter, the start of the year. And you were just this tiny little key, uh, tiny little box that just walked around on legs. But the puzzle element was that you could if uh, you could spawn cubes out of your head, and they all came out in a chain like a snake or a Tetris piece and what have you. Mm-hmm. And you had to use this ability to get around levels. So you could use them as almost hooks to attach and then pull yourself up on, or bridges to put yourself out, or or just little steps to jump up to higher places. And it was really imaginative. And um, it, I, it was on my top five of last year. Um, and I recommend if you've got a 3DS and you have any um, traveling time that you want to fill up, this is definitely something you should look at. Um, but yeah, um, it was just announced today there was a, a sequel um, heading out in Japan. So... Let's have a see whether it hits Europe or not. That's really interesting. I mean, I, I, it's quite funny because I, I am I need a I'm going to London on Friday, so I need a game uh, for my commute. And I was going to because Volume uh, Mike Biffle's Volume was released oh, yes. today on the from Vita, um, so I was going to go that. But this looks quite interesting actually. It's just like uh, it's kind of black and white with a tinge of colour, and it's by the makers of Kirby, isn't it? Yes, yes, which is primarily why I got drawn towards it and then got sucked in by... He's he's surprisingly adorable for a square, but... Um, <laughs> like but Thomas Was Alone. That studio seemed... <laughs> yes, oh, yeah. Oh, I love Thomas Was Alone. That was such a great game. But how Lab seemed to make a... Like, Kirby was a circle. This one's a square. Let's see where they go next. <laughs> wow. The world's their oyster. That's... Uh, yeah. that's, that's really interesting. It's, it's quite a nice... Like I say, it's quite a cute little character got kind of two eyes and just two legs in a box. So it's like... Yeah. Hmm, yeah. Interesting. Superb. And right, so that's the end of our kind of regular news. And now it's time that we head over to our VR news desk for the latest news in, in the VR world. VR desk. Right, well, the first thing that we've got is that the Oculus Rift's touch motion controllers have been delayed unfortunately, until the second half of 2016. Um, So that's a shame. It's not going to affect the Oculus going on sale, and we'll get to that in a second. Um, But, yeah, it's been delayed, which is a a bit of a shame. And these sort of mould to your hands. They're quite interesting controllers. It might be worth just putting a link here in the the notes so people that haven't had a look can just have a look how these motion controls work because they're quite interesting, the way that they sort of mould around your hand. Yeah, it'll it'll be quite interesting. So there's, there's no actual problem, it's just merely they've been put back to make sure they can satisfy demand and make sure they're up to scratch. Yeah, yeah, basically. They, they, just, they said that they need more time before release. Um, that's, that's pretty much what we've got. Pre-orders will begin a, a few months prior to launch. So they haven't really gone into why. They've just said what's happening, and what's happening is there's, there's, yeah. there's going to be a delay there. So the Oculus, which which has you know a time of a time of podding, uh, is available for pre-order. That comes with an Xbox controller, doesn't it? So it does. So that's gone on. I went live, didn't it, this evening um, around seven-ish or six-ish today, um, and the pre-orders opened up. So we found out the price. Um, so that's going to be five hundred ninety-nine dollars, which does not include shipping um, or tax. Or tax. Yeah, uh, or for, if you're here in Blighty, then £499. I think that includes tax, but does not include shipping. So the shipping will be £30. Um, and yeah, with that, you get the Xbox One controller. Um, you get a yep. remote control, an Oculus remote control. Uh, you get the cables, <laughs> and you get Eve, Valkyrie, and Lucky's Tail games with it as well. This. There's also there was an ominous looking sensor as well. Is that just to is that kind of similar to what the PlayStation camera will be? I imagine so. VR? Yeah, so you get the headset, the sensor, the remote, obviously the cables. I guess I think that's for the remote, isn't it? Or am I I could be making that up. I thought that was there just to accept the, the remote control. Oh, okay. So it's not for tracking. I don't I don't think the Oculus has got tracking. No, I think the, I think it, it just used the Oculus, I'm pretty sure it just uses the accelerometer within the HMD. Rather than because it, it's not you can't walk around the room with uh, with the Oculus. It's, it's sort of a, a yeah. it, it will it will measure a certain amount of tilt, 
but there's no getting up and wandering around, so that you wouldn't need a camera for tracking for it. So no, I think I, th- I think it must yeah. be just for the remote. I'm honestly getting confused between all the features of the sheer number of headsets <laughs> that are coming out. In this it is feature. a bit bewildering, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. And there's more. I mean, we we mainly uh, stick with the big three, which is Oculus, Vive, and PSVR. Um, but then, you know, as you yep. as you chatted about earlier, there's loads of uh, sort of lightweight mobile options, including um, Gear VR um, that we were talking about earlier, and there's Google Cardboard, obviously that will fit almost anything. Yep. There's there's loads of the sort of those those cheap entries in, and then there's a lot more of the sort of bigger boys as well. It's just that it does get it just gets a bit too much. So yeah. So, 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 what do you make of the price though? Five, uh, six hundred dollars, five hundred pounds. We're talking like PS3 levels of launch pricing, mm. and Oculus have have gone out on record of saying because there's a piece that's come up on Polygon since we started recording, breaking news, blah, 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 um, <laughs> that they are basically saying that they are not really making any profit on it. This is what it comes yeah. as. This this is them trying to put it out as cheap as possible. And the reason they're saying it is that expensive is because that is what they believe should be the minimum spec for a consumer version. This is the hardware they feel is the best it should be before it goes out into the masses. So they are obviously going for quality over pushing it out cheap and cheap. I thought you were going to say then, that is what they believe that people will pay. <laughs> well, that's what you're going to... People will get a second job for... Yeah. But yeah, you know, Palmer Lucky always said that they were going to push it out as close to cost as possible because they want the ta- they want the yeah. take-up, don't they? They want the uptake from the people to, to get yeah. it to take off. So, yeah, mm. for me, it's a bit... I was expecting this one to be cheaper. I was expecting PSVR to come in the cheapest, this to be the mid one, and Vive to be the most expensive from from everything I've read. And this being more expensive yeah. than I expected, I don't... I don't I, not really on board for getting an Oculus at this stage. I imagine I might get one at one stage, unless Vive encompasses the need for that, and I won't have to. But the one I've got my eye on is Vive. But what it does for me is it makes me think, crikey, Vive, they're, they're saying that's going to that's sort of the premier one, it's going to be the most expensive. And this being at $599, it makes me think, crikey, what's, what's Vive going to be? That's the big thing for me. That's the big hit in news. It's like, BSVR will probably be the cheapest one but it might not be as cheap as we expected you know this is probably this is probably two hundred dollars more than i thought it was going to be so so if it had been four hundred dollars three hundred quid you might have jumped or would you still be reticent about well i wouldn't have jumped just because i want five and i i feel i feel it's a bit bit of a duplication to get both so but i would have been more comfortable with preparing myself for the price of five because then I would have been thinking that Vive would probably be this price. I was expecting Vive to yeah. be about this price. And Oculus has come in at this price, which I believe was going to be the medium one. Um, and so, yeah, it's just it's just a bit of... Not a blow, but it's just a bit of a concern. It's like, oh, crikey, how much money are they going to be asking for Vive? It also makes me think that as... Uh, Shuhei Yoshida has said, you know, he, he said that the price of PSVR is going to probably be the same as a console. And I think both of you guys have both sort of retorted with that and said, yeah, well, like the PS3 launch console. And it makes it that it, that, that could be the case. But yeah, but they might... But I, I almost... I, I think this is, this is where we start shifting, though, because I just wonder if for... And th- this is me just spitballing. I just wonder if for a long time... Like over the last 10 years, we've almost had a lot of not necessarily subsidized consoles, but consoles have been made to a price point where we actually feel that that is you have a you have a spec. This is the price and we will build the spec to that price. Whereas if you look at things like like Surface and the iPads and things like that, $600 is where they start and no one bats an eyelid at yeah. that. And yet when this comes out, which again is this really high tech, really like cutting edge piece of equipment, and there's concerns about it. I, I can understand people going, right, this is just too expensive. I can't get it. But I've heard so many people saying like, well, that's just ludicrous. So it's not. If you look at what high tech, like cutting edge stuff costs, this is actually really quite and probably a generous like starting point for it all. They could have probably done miles higher, but they seem to have been putting on the lower end of the iPad surface, like high tech phone price point. And I think the only thing they need to do to try and make it more accessible is maybe start putting out, rather than just a flat price point, get this down to Toys R Us, get this into Carphone Warehouse, and have payment plans on it to make it far more affordable for everyone to get. Yeah, yeah. I imagine, you know, and this is, I'm just spitballing here as well about the future, 
this will probably become smaller and it'll be sort of a wearable thing i think in the future not so much when when you're blind <laughs> with it but do you, do you see what i'm getting at it'd be something you could slip on and off yeah and then you would yeah. you would want to be linked to to the network and at, at that time at that point then it would be sort of something you buy in a mobile phone shop wouldn't it because you'd come with a plan because it, it yeah it is yes. a, it is a yes. standalone piece of equipment would require you know plugging into the uh, the wireless LAN wherever it is, and then then you'd buy it with with your with your megabytes package with it. Um, but I think you're absolutely right that 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 would be a great way of, of, of pitching it. It's and when you put it like that, it's because we sort of used to the cheap prices of consoles, and they, they engineer consoles to be as cheap as possible because the profits come through the games that we buy. And we are yep. it, you're, you're absolutely right. We're used to paying you know four hundred pound tops really for a console. And so this comes out, and you're like, "Whoa, you know that that is quite a lot." But when you put it in terms of like buying Apple stuff, then it is it's equivalent, if not cheap. If Apple brought if Apple had brought this VR out and it was this price, everybody would be like, "Wow, that's 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 really good." Yeah, yeah, it'd be yeah. like, where, "Where do I pre-order yeah. right now?" I, you, 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 I mean, don't forget, with this is first generation of this tech. You know, if you look at 4K TVs when they first came out, they were uber expensive, and now they're you know they they have they've halved by about fifty. You know, they have halved uh, for for a brand new set. So, I mean, okay, we've got HDR that's coming out now, so that might push that up slightly. But before CES this this week, you know, they they had a lot cheaper. So this this could potentially get cheaper as we go along. This is generation one this is your early adopter kit and as an early adopter you 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 have to get used to playing the highest price and also expect a, a, another release either within 12 yeah, months and, you know if you take moore's law into account this will probably be hopefully not twice as good but the, there'll be a better version coming along at the, at the same price or less that will allow oculus to make more profit on it you know they, they could push they could they could make it a lot better and bring it probably down by a hundred dollars but they'll be making a lot more profit in a year because they'll you know they'll have really honed the craft and the technology will be cheaper hopefully should be you know if it follows the law that's been going on for years um so yeah if you if you take the plunge now you've got to sort of face up to the fact that you're going to pay the highest price the vr will ever be yeah yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, will this actually will this be sold in stores? Do you think? Do you think come Christmas time you'll go into whatever store and you'll be able to pick up, you know, an Oculus, a Vive, a PlayStation VR? Do you do you guys see that happening, or will this be online? No, only? select retailers uh, will get the uh, will get the kit starting it starting right, in April, like, according to Oculus. <laughs> Like a Microsoft store um, would then start stocking Oculus Rift or something. Yeah. yeah. I, I could see it be almost tied because you can imagine someone like GameStop or Game itself over here trying to get the exclusivity because that would drive footfall into the store as well. Yes. Um, but at, interesting. I think the other thing, like driving up costs that none want, none of us have really spoken about explicitly, is just how big a PC you need under the hood as well. Because um, as much as I'm not willing to fork out like five hundred, uh, six hundred dollars. For, for for this I've just looked at the spec as well and it needs like a GTX 970 uh, an i5 4590 equivalent 8 gigabytes of RAM uh, HDMI 3.1 3 USB 3.0 ports and 1 USB 2 what? I, yeah <laughs> So it's it's just like there's a whole new barrier has just walked in front of me at this point in time. Yeah, I mean, it, it, have you nice. got a have you got a pretty strong PC? Because you know that me and Anthony haven't. Have you got a decent PC, James? You... I haven't. I haven't got one that. You haven't good. got one that good. That's what I was sort of getting at. So you'd have to you'd have to yeah. upgrade. Because yes. I, yeah, because yeah, um, me and Anthony have factored in. If we make the jump to Oculus or Vive, it's like not only is it the price of that, but we're looking at you know uh, quite a bit for the PC as well. Yeah, it's terrifying. It's terrifying that. If I jumped in now, it's it's probably a, what, a two grand investment for for VR. Oh, I don't say that. I see. I had fifteen hundred quid earmarked for it, and this news shocks me and thinks that I might not be able to do it for Vive. For yeah. Vive, I'll, I'll be really interested now to see. I mean, obviously, Vive had a bit of a show at CES. They they were showing it. They were showing some. Uh, they had tech demos there. You could play it. Um, PlayStation. I was expecting. I'm glad I didn't stay up. I was actually going to stay up and watch the Sony conference um, just because I'm interested in not only the PlayStation VR but the TV side of it as well. Um, but they they just kind of gave a bit of a did the same demo. They didn't really. They did. They said it's coming out later this year. They gave the kind of same story, and we didn't get a 
release date or a price for it. Um, but I'll be really interested to see now, kind of how now that Oculus has stuck the flag in the sand where the other guys are, are coming in at. Yeah, I'm glad they have. You know, it's been a long time coming, hasn't it? At least we know now. Like you yeah, said, I mean, with the, where that middle ground it, is. It could be like you know when they when they announced the Xbox One's price point, and then Sony, uh, you know, had a conference a couple of hours later, and they just kind of did all of the stuff, there. and it's cheaper, <laughs> and it's this, and it's that. You know, you can imagine uh, maybe kind of Vive was going, well, we were going to go for six hundred, you know, well, we were going to go for four hundred, we can up it now another another couple of hundred dollars, you know. It'd be quite interesting to see how this has changed um, their price points. Yeah, it's strange because just before we started recording, I read a a little article that said Sony had already responded and said. That the Oculus was too much. I mean, that's easy for them to say because they've always pitched it at a lower price point. Mm. But as for sort of aggressive pricing, um, everything I've read sort of says they're all sort of working together hand in hand because it's a new technology and they all want to they all want it to succeed. So they're sort of working together. I mean, they won't. I don't imagine they were talked about the pricing, but I don't know. Maybe maybe this is like they'll all think what. You know, if, if if they all decided, like, if PSVR decided, say, well, we're going we're to be 100 quid less than whatever Oculus is, you know, and Vive decided... I suppose it, they don't. you don't make decisions like that, though. It's based on the tech, isn't it? It's based on the tech, isn't it? And like, like James was saying there, Oculus have done it as low as they can, but this, this tech is so cutting edge, and that's what's pumped the price up. And so Vive's got more tech than this in it. That's why it's going to be more expensive. And presumably PSVR isn't quite as much of a technological cutting edge piece of equipment as Oculus so hence it's yeah. going to be a bit cheaper but yeah you know I'm thinking we're probably going to be looking at 400 quid for PSVR and 600 or 650 or even so flipping neck 700 quid for Vive yeah, I mean, it's quite interesting to see that when this went live, I think it was like 4 o'clock UK time, um, that the shipping date was April, um, and that's now changed. Looking at the site now, just refreshed uh, shop.oculus.com, and it's May 2016 now. So they've already kind of, they're already kind of pushing out by a month. So they've obviously had a lot of people have, uh, there's been a lot of interest, um, and they've now kind of pushed the shipping date back. So it's, it's very interesting that there's obviously had, a, I mean, I know when it went live, when the website went live I was interested I was intrigued to see what the price was so I had a quick look um, and the site was you know it wasn't available um, but uh, a couple of refreshes and it popped back in showing 599 as the price uh, but it did have that you know instant uh, that the site was just struggling for uh, because of traffic yeah yeah I quite like it that um, Palmer Lucky said like a lot of things um, that that get launched, they they sort of try and create a frenzy, and they say, "Oh, you know, if you're not quick, they'll be gone." Um, but he's gone the opposite way of that, and he said that he can't see any way that they won't be able to fill every order. And he said, "You know, just pre-order it. They're what, it's not going to close. We're not going to close the pre-orders. If you want one, uh, he said that he's certain you'll be able to get one. But what they'll do if they, he said, if they unfeasibly did run out of stock, it would just be that they would change the shipping date for you." So yeah, I think that's, that's you nice. know yeah I think that's a really nice way of saying it I think it's it's a confident it comes from a position of confidence as well because you know there's going to be I should be getting one of these but um, if it wasn't for Vive I think I'd probably be tempted with this um, but yeah I just thought that was a nice refreshing change it was nice and I liked what he said as well about because it's it's instantly like oh five hundred ninety nine dollars and it's like four hundred ninety nine pounds it's not fair because we're paying more in, in in Britain again as usual in the UK. But he actually tweeted about that as well, and he said uh, he said international rift prices are not bloated. You know, like we always say, or I always say, ah, oh, they've bloated it up. He says they've got to cover the required taxes. Sales tax in USA works differently, and he said all the international prices are essentially the converted US price plus the sort of the required taxes and customs fees, etc. So they've converted that price from the US exactly, but then the price of admission into our countries equals the price that's what they're saying you know i don't think he'd lie about that i mean that's really good that he kind of went on twitter to say that 
you know we're going to be fulfilling the order it may just it's it's not going to stop that ebay market you you will know that there will be uh, oculus rifts on ebay for elephantine prices come april but at least it's helped you know that you like say for instance darren if you just suddenly went do you know what i need this and i want it in april that you don't kind of look to ebay and you pay kind of twice as much so that's quite cool i quite like that that's happened yeah um, yeah you know if you, re- if he's, he said to us all if you just apply a bit of patience everybody will get one so yeah the, mm. the ebay profiteers can't they haven't got that that sort of handhold they'd usually have yes yeah that's good that's good the other thing is i'm kicking myself because as you guys will know if you backed it on kickstarter and paid more than 300 dollars you'd be getting one it seems like a bargain now doesn't it does for oh, hindsight is a wonderful fist thing. In the world. <laughs> <laughs> if only, if maybe they would have told us. I think, but maybe they did. Did they actually say that you'll get a? It might have been a, a, on on one of the tiers. Actually, yeah. I mean, I, I don't think I even looked. I just thought, ah, oh, what's all this VR? It's nonsense. <laughs> So if you backed it on Kickstarter for $300, you got a kit and you got a dev kit. Um, and now they're saying that they'll refresh it with a, a retail kit. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Just just imagine, though, if you did that, like you'd backed it all those years ago, but you hadn't updated your PC. And now you're looking at this gorgeous piece of kit that you're holding your hands, but knew there was a like a thousand pound rig <laughs> between yeah, you yes. and using it. Yeah, I don't know if yeah. that would be better or worse than my current situation of having neither. It's the gift that keeps on taking. Oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that would be a kicker, wouldn't it? That would be a kicker. Yeah, I still can't believe that it needs three HDMI ports. I'm still kind of. <laughs> was it three or was it four? Was it three it was plus four. one? It was three, three, and one, two. Oh my goodness, mate! It's nuts. Wow, wow, wow. So also, there's quite a bit of a VR news today. Um, Nvidia have said that it's just a bit of a stat, really. To run a game in VR on a PC, it takes seven times the processing power than it would take that PC to run the game as a standard PC game, which I thought was quite interesting. I didn't know that. I didn't know it was like seven times, you know, so to to explore whatever it is. See, I, I find it difficult to make a comparison there because something like Tomb Raider wouldn't really fit VR as well. But say to explore that environment in VR would take seven times as much as actually exploring it on the PC. It's quite interesting. Yeah, um, I'm wondering where he actually gets these from, because it's... I could almost understand double. Like, you're trying to render out your scene again, because like, you've you've got all your, your characters, they've all been animated, they've all been moved around, and then you render it out into 2D. Then you have to render it out again. So I wonder if he's talking about, like, the fidelity. Like, he thinks that PCs will have to be seven times more powerful to get over that sort of like uncanny valley of living in the world. Because I'm sure that box that sits next to the PlayStation won't be Seven effectively times, six yeah. PlayStations in one box. <laughs> you doubt the power of technology, James. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to replace the PS4 and everything. You don't need a new PC. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're absolutely right. I don't. I don't know where the heck they get that from. I mean, seven times is is it's astronomical, astronomical, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. He estimates. Um, this is a guy from Nvidia. Um, Jason Paul, general manager of Nvidia Shield Gaming, and he also said that he reckons that at the moment there's around 13 million PCs in the market that people have got that are powerful enough to run VR in the right way straight away. And he says you can extend that number to 25 million if the VR game makers use their proprietary NVIDIA Gameworks VR software, um, which makes the VR processing more efficient. Yeah. So that's quite interesting. So when you compare that, 13 million ready-to-go PCs, it's, it's, when, you, when you think that there's already, like you said before, Anthony, over 30 million PS4s sitting ready, hmm. it's interesting. I never thought that the PC would be sort of the... The lower end of the scale, I thought the PC would be would be the base that would have the largest amount of inst- you know installed units ready. I guess that it's the variability as well, isn't it? Like, you, what is a PC nowadays? Is well, almost like just a general computer? Is is like a, a tablet? Is a is a phone? Where does where does it stop at that point? I get you look at like the stats of what you install Windows on, and it goes like all over the place from shops to things. So I guess you can make whatever stats you want, but. 
I think what they're trying to do to counter this, I've seen in other news, is that I think NVIDIA, GeForce and Oculus, I think all in their own different way, are almost having certified badges that they can put onto machines going, this is VR ready, this will run our VR software. That's which cool. will hopefully get around a lot of these issues. Because, let's face it, if you're looking at the... Ba- it's it's hard enough at the best of times, well, back in the day when you used to get your boxes from Toys R Us, you'd look at the top and going, well, I think I've got that RAM, and I've definitely got that processor, but that's a weird name graphics card, so I'm not sure. And that just goes up as you've now got to have a PC and a piece of hardware to put on your face, and then... <laughs> think- it's just yeah. getting more complicated as time goes by. Yeah, you're sort of going to want to get in a bundle, aren't you, really? Yeah. And yeah. the thing is, it's it's all well and good him saying this, um, and there is more PS4s, but they're cheaper. That's why there's more of them. Yeah. And they're going to be good, but they're not going to be as good as the Oculus running on yeah. a PC that can run it right. So, you know, you're going to get a better... If you pay more money and you've got the PC that's at the, at the, at the recommended spec for Oculus, you're going to get a better experience. You're yes. probably going to get a very good experience on PSVR. That's that's your entry point. Um, and then you, you, the early adopters or fans of PSVR or whatever, you're going to get a better experience on, on the PC, on Oculus, or on, on Vive, because there's just, there's just more power there, isn't there? And that's where the cost comes in. And that's yeah. why there's less of them. Because machines that have got that much power are costly beasts. Yeah, I've I've just quickly scrolled through his transcripts and his sevenfold increase comes from his estimation that most games run at thirty, and you want to run them at least at ninety. He says so. He's basically talking not just rendering out, but rendering out more more often to make sure it's a smooth experience. Is that frames per second you're talking? Yeah, about? yeah. Okay, I thought it had to be sixty, so it was thirty per eye, but it's actually ninety. So there's a like an intersected frame between that or something. I think so. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Interesting. It just it just makes me. I usually do crumble and just buy tech as soon as it comes out. But everything this looks at is now. I can very happily wait for this. Yeah, there's nothing about it. The experience like draw you in. It draws me in, but not to the price of what would probably cost about fifteen hundred quid at this point in time. Yes, I think for me, it's that PlayStation VR is that entry point for me because I've already got half of the kit. It's going to be a cheaper. It might it might not be as interesting because I think you know the the PC scene is definitely going to give us the most interesting games. You know, like the one you were talking about, kind of a. Uh, you know, don't stop talking or everyone explodes whatever the game's called you know it's just like so it's going to give us the interesting stuff like that but I think for to just make sure that it works and to make sure that I'm happy with it and I'm enjoying it I think that PlayStation VR is going to be my entry point oh stop talking so much sense it's making me feel like a mug you're making me I, I feel like know, a mug I, I, I don't know what's happened. I don't know what's happened to me. This isn't you. I know what am I hearing? This is ridiculous. (laughs) I'm getting old or something. I don't know what this is. Wow. (laughs) You see, I've had this this earmark. It's this me getting a a, a rift or a vibe. It became vibe when I when I read about it. Is my I was forty last year, Mm. and this was supposed to be my present. It was supposed to be out by sort of autumn last year. So I banked my fortieth birthday present, and the idea was I was going to get a vibe. And I was going to get a PC to run it. It's all part of my amazing 40th that I did nothing for because of this. And I've sat here waiting, and I'll be at my next birthday <laughs> before anything <laughs> happens. But so I sort of all this time I thought, right, I'm going to get a demon PC that I've always wanted. It's going to be fantastic. You know, I'll have the games and I'll have Vive. It's going to be brilliant. But when you say things like that about PSVR, and I've thought it myself, and I think I said it in the last podcast or so, you know, you talk a lot of sense, and it's kind of like, why bother? Why not just get a, get a PSVR, pay less? Save money and see what it's like. You know, when it, yeah. I get that feel and it conflicts me, and that's why I don't like it when you talk so much sense like that. I, I <laughs> like expecting you to say, go on, do it, you know. James, James I mean, gets I, his Ghostbusters I, firehouse. I want my vibe. <laughs> but I'm, I mean, I'm only saying this because you know, yesterday Sony released their new HDR TVs. You know, and I've already, <laughs> I've, already I've already had a chat with one of the guys who kind of I deal with my AV stuff with. He's my supplier. He's my pusher. Um, a fantastic company that does a lot of AV setups. Um, and um, you know, I've already said you know, put me down for the 65 inch. You know, so I'm, I, you know, my my frivolousness is is elsewhere here, which is. You know, which is why I'm not throwing money down on Oculus, and I really hope Nicola doesn't listen to all of this podcast this week. <laughs> I see. Well, if we get to the two and three quarter hour part, we're sort of free, aren't we? Then we, yeah, we, yeah, we can say what we want. Well. But yeah, so it's, so it's metered. It's been it's been sort of it's been metered by by investments in other tech and other shiny stuff. That makes me feel a bit better. If you're getting that, then I can feel good about a PC and Vive. 
Absolutely. I did the measurement. I got the tape measure out when I saw the specs this morning. And my, my 4K TV that I have done in the movie room has ginormous, gorgeous speakers either side. And the new 65-inch HDR, which is more important than 4K, that HDR screen, is the same size um, with no bezel mm. as my current screen. So it's not it's it's a bigger screen. It's 55 to 65. But because of those ginormous speakers, it's the same real estate. Yeah. So I'm just like, sign me up. I love it when they do things like that. That's fantastic. <laughs> exactly. So I, I get a quick tweet to just add popcorn, my uh, my guys, and I was like, sign me up. <laughs> but you're, t- you know? but you're saying there then, and this is a question I was just going to ask you, and I'd be interested in your answer to this as well, James. You're trading then the opportunity for a full immersive VR experience in Vive for upgrading something that's all, that you've already got, a 2D panel, just to a bigger one. Yes, yes, because I want to watch the Lego the movie in full HDR. <laughs> right, and that's it. And to you, that's that's more important than VR. Yes, because I know that I've got PlayStation VR coming. Ah, and, yeah, of course. You know, and I'll, and I'll get that. Yeah, I guess it's choosing your battles because I'm moving house, hopefully, um, this year. And with that, I'm going to upgrade my telly. And I've been looking at what, what should I try and trade off. Like, I, I really don't care about 3D, but that seems to come with most things. But I've been trying to balance. Like, do I want 4K? Do I want OLED? What do I want? Like, you know, the, the contrast. Do I want the updates? Like, quickly for gaming. And I've basically boiled down to: I don't watch enough movies for 4K to be a precedent right now. I much prefer a better picture quality. So I'm almost going with like: I just want OLED. And I know, like, maybe in five years' time or or, or longer, if my wife's listening, um, I'll upgrade <laughs> to a 4K <laughs> telly then. But for me now, OLED is at the point. This is that is the thing that I want. That is the thing that defines the experience most for me. Having that the the best array of colours, like the deep blacks. And I almost look at the the VR experience by comparison. Going, how much do I want to invest in this? What, what level should I come in at? And I think I'm almost coming the same. Like I'm actually halfway torn between the Samsung um, Gear VR because that actually just proved enough. I had so much fun with the um, Keep Talking Don't Explode. But if everything else, how much more do I want to pay for it? And I think it will be the Sony uh, set that comes in as that best cost to performance ratio. But I know I if it kicks in, then I'll be happy to buy something further down the line that is better but more proven. Yeah, and it's a safe bet because there's the install base there. There's a lot of likelihood that there's going to be a lot of uptake with it on on, on Sony's PS4, and you're going to have friends on there in all likelihood to share the experiences with if they've got some multiplayer experiences out there. So it makes perfect sense. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. But I still can't shake me wanting an HTC Vive. It's really bad. Oh, it's such sense. I, I want to break that and just get a PSVR with you guys. We'll see what happens. We'll see what happens when the prices hit. Yes, yeah. indeed. I mean, you know, it's it's quite interesting because you know HTC Vive, you know, they could come out with Half Life Three. You know, they could be do they could do something like that. You know, and it would be you know it would be really interesting to see what just what happens when they make the announcement. Yeah, yeah. Cool. So I think the uh, the next item on the news desk is the Vive's big technology breakthrough. So for a while, they've been hinting that they will hold back production and pre-orders for CES, which is a big consumer electronic show that's going over on in Vegas, I think it is, um, yep. at the moment. Um, so there's a whole load of new TVs, washing machines, and smart cars that are all coming out. Um, and I was actually disappointed to find out the Vive's big technological breakthrough was a front-facing camera. Now, I was really disappointed by this, because one of the features my brother showed me on his, his um, Gear VR version was exactly that. Oh, really? Yeah. What, like a- a- AR almost? Yeah, or... yeah. I, th- I don't know if it was just like a feature so that you could turn on and you could see where you were in the living room so that you could see if people were making obscene gestures at you while you were unaware. <laughs> um, so I'm not sure how much um, there is in it, but I guess as it is a phone and apps can access the, the camera through it, then that is perfectly a viable thing to do. Mm-hmm. Um. But yeah, I was just a bit disappointed. I don't know if you guys were expecting something grander. 
Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think we waxed, we were, we were talking about it last week, and we were kind of throwing around some theories, and then we were talking, you know, or the week before, you know, I, th- I thought it would be cordless, and, and Darren was racking his brain. We just couldn't, we didn't quite know, you know, maybe the that suit that they were showing off for the PlayStation experience, you know, maybe it was something like that. But I was expecting something, you know, I, I, to be quite honest with you, I thought we already had that. I thought we already had a front-facing camera. Um, so yeah, so I was a bit kind of, it was a bit of a, a bit of an anti-climax but uh, you know fantastic that it's there you know so so I guess the Oculus doesn't have this then no 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 so when you're wearing the Oculus you're, you're blind um, HTC Vive thought it was that much of a breakthrough that they delayed release to change the hardware uh, and yeah my the wind went out of my sails when I read the announcement because as we discussed we couldn't think about what it could be but we were expecting something great with I mean big very very big technological breakthrough we expecting I don't know what I was expecting but it's just it wasn't that. It wasn't that. No. But it does solve a few things, you know, like there's been a lot of people saying, well, how could you go and have a drink? Well, you've got VR on now, you could. How could you, you know, move position without taking it off and breaking that immersion? And what it made yeah. me think is that it takes a little bit of HoloLens's USP away because it might allow, it's going to probably allow blending of reality with virtual reality that couldn't be done before unless you use HoloLens. Yeah, I guess so. Maybe you know that that's exactly it. Because I guess there would be an option or a way of doing it—a button that would then just cut down what you're doing or allow you to see outside, so you can you know like kind of grab grab that drink rather than knocking everything off your table. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, no, it does it. It does enable you to to have that that AR um, cool AR feature that that um, that the Hololens is touting. Yeah, and if it allows you to blend, then. It's sort of getting to HoloLens without actually being transparent over your eyes, but if it allows you to blend and do the mixed reality thing, it kind of steals a little bit of HoloLens's glory. Um, so that would be interesting, and if they can then start building experiences around that idea, then maybe there's breakthroughs in technology that they can see because they're in the VR industry that maybe we can't see yet. That's sort of my silver lining from from the wind being taken out of my sails with it. Yeah, ho- ho- yeah it'll be interesting. Hoping for better things. Mm. Um, yeah, the no- next thing um, really is just I'm going to put a link in the bottom of the show notes to a video. Um, it's a bit of an oldish video, um, even though it was only published the other day. But it's just basically it's a bit of a chat with uh, Richard Marks, Dr. Richard Marks, who's the ch- chief architect for PSVR, and it's an interview chatting with him about PlayStation VR, and it shows some people using it, and he just talks about it, and it's just quite good to see it being used. Um, it. The reason I say it might be a bit old is because they refer to it as Morpheus, which is either the guy interviewing him has forgotten it's called PSVR now, um, or it's just a little bit old. So I'm going to pop that into the into the notes at the uh, bottom of the show for people to just have a look at if they're if they're interested. Um, yeah, and the final thing that I've got to discuss is just some stats. You both like your stats, don't you? Oh, oh yes. I do like a good stat. <laughs> Here we go then. So these are some stats for analyst super data research um, who have made done a report on VR adoption this year. Okay, so they reckon there'll be 39 million installs by the end of the year. I mean, we're we're sort of lauding it that 2016 is the year of VR. It's the launch of VR, um, really with the big boys launching it. And though you know, there's been the, the, the lightweight entry points up till now as well um and so the main and i'll put this link in the bottom as well because there's a lot of information here but we've been on the podcast coming up to three hours so i'll just read the headline bullet point stats so super data research say that the worldwide market for vr gaming will reach 5.1 billion in revenues in 2016 and an install base of 55.8 million consumers they say that the european market is going to lead with 1.9 billion in total sales, so that's interesting. But I mean, Europe, yes. Europe's a big territory, isn't it? Um, but yeah. it's it's nice. I usually imagine that it's going to be the you know US. So it's nice that that Europe's estimated to to lead this uh, new revolution. Um, low barriers for entry will allow white mobile VR to initially reach 71 percent of the consumer market. So this is what we're talking about with the Gear VR, with the Google Cardboard, and all the uh, all the devices of that ilk so it's saying that there's going to be a lot more take up as people get more aware of it of using their phones to use it 
maybe that'll become the key way. You know, you never know how these things go. Maybe they'll, people just won't like the bulkiness of these big headsets. Mobiles are getting more powerful all the time. Maybe that will lead the way. Maybe that'll become the de facto way of using it. Who knows? But they say 27 million units in 2016 of those um, because it's a cheap price point to enter into the experience. They say that virtual reality gaming presents opportunity for small studios and indies. They're saying that these studios are currently developing 829 VR games collectively, and large publishers have taken a more wait-and-see approach. I also read that the larger developers um, and publishers, sorry, are sort of on the back foot because they're sort of blinkered into what they've been doing, you know, the regurgitation of, of series of IPs and yearly increments. And that doesn't really suit VR, which needs really to sort of think again about the experience. So that this is where the indies have got the strength and the innovation and the flexibility right. yeah, to, to do this. So that's yeah, really the interesting. Flexibility is crucial at that point. They just get to knee jerk, I guess, towards the trends because they're small enough and agile enough just to, to react to them. Yeah, it's all about that agility, isn't it? The grandfathers, they're too sort of old and long in the tooth to be able to bend towards this trend isn't it if you like <laughs> excuse the analogy um and then they also say the total investments in virtual and augmented reality so augmented more like the hololens thing and could be with the camera the htc vive reached a combined 6.1 billion between 2012 and 2015 which uh, has triggered current market momentum and it's grown industry expectations so really positive bullet points there and i'll add that as i say to the um to the show notes for people to read in more detail but it's really interesting and it's really positive slant on what 2016 and vr could bring us it really is the year of vr isn't it It really is that kind of it's it's going to it's going to happen this year you know finally we are going to get some some future tech with with proper 4k and vr you know it's 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 going to be an interesting one and maybe you know nintendo coming out with something else as well yeah yeah and what that will be would be so interesting who knows who knows and with that that's it for this epic this epic podcast <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you very much big thank you for james for uh for sticking with it <laughs> for, for pitching for pitching it's been a the pleasure epicness. as ever i'm sure i created half the tangents <laughs> yes that's a, you're in there with the epicness and uh, don't forget you can keep up with us we're at gamersofthelostspark.com you can also find us on Facebook on Twitter we're at Lost Spark Pod um, we're on YouTube and we're also on that uh, Gamers of Lost Spark community on the PlayStation 4 Darren where can we find you online? Yeah, you can find me as Wythomator on PS4, Xbox One and Twitch, Daz a Gamer on YouTube and at Daz Whitten on Twitter James, where can people catch up with you? I am Big Sheep on Twitter, Xbox, PlayStation, Nintendo, so send me a message if you'd like to chat. Fantastic. And for me, I am Chessman on Xbox Live. I'm PS hyphen Chessman on the PlayStation Network and Chessman UK on Twitter. Uh, if you have any feedback, please send it to our email address. That's feedback at gamersoflostspark.com. And also, if you're feeling generous, please leave us a review on iTunes. Uh, it helps Pod get noticed and we also get onto that all important page we've had over the Christmas break. Thank you to all of those people that have um, given us a five star review and also to the people that have added some reviews. Maybe we'll read them out next time but with that that's about it for this epic one so thank you very much <laughs> say goodbye chaps see ya goodbye <laughs>